I have just talked to Father Oscar Hubert of the Holy Trinity Catholic Church. He and another priest tell me that the pair of men have just administered the last rites of the Catholic Church to President Kennedy. President Kennedy has been assassinated. It's official now. The president is dead. Women here in shock. Some have fainted. Grown men, Secret Service men standing by the emergency room. Tears streaming down their face. There's only one word to describe the picture here, and that's grief, and much of it. It's official. As of just a few moments ago, the president of the United States is dead. Welcome to I Can Murder a Podcast, the finale of Series 7. We are here. Benjamin, how are you doing? Very, very good. It's so good to be here. Uh, this case, I'm changing my mind every single minute. Um, oh, wow. See so, what we land on at the end yeah. of the day. Well, that's it. I'm just going to go with what I land on. <laughs> yeah, great. But no, really good to be here. Uh, I'm excited to cover this case with you boys. How, how are you doing, Producer Dan? Uh, very good. Thanks for asking. Very good. Um, just want to say... Uh, well done to you boys, both of you. I'm very proud of you Aww. for completing another long, long, long series. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dan, I'm proud of you as well, and I'm proud of Chloe, and I'm proud of Phil, and I'm proud of Arbonsi as well for this Arbonsi, series. Indeed, yeah, yeah. Big thank you to those guys for the, for the hard work this series has been. It's, it's very much appreciated. So this is the first time we've been sat here with a uh, sort of on-the-fly finale. Um, we usually have a concrete, this is going to be our finale, and, uh, and we're quite sort of bold with our choices. But this one... We did the, uh, well, and there are some similarities to draw here, but we did the case of Princess Diana a couple of weeks ago. And uh, that was initially penciled in for our finale, but we thought, no, there's not enough to that case. Let's pick a bigger one. Yeah. And uh, here we are today. I think I think afterwards we said we both said that could have been could have, we could have ended on that and be could have fine. ended on that yeah. yeah but but this is a case very different to the Diana case in the sense that going into it I think everyone kind of believes there is a conspiracy behind it mm-hmm. whereas yeah. with Diana we both went into well, I went into it definitely thinking it was just an accident yeah whereas this went into it thinking yeah it's a conspiracy it's it's everyone knows it's a conspiracy but I don't really know they didn't really know much about it and about the uh, different ideas of conspiracy yeah. and after doing the research of it it kind of. Yeah, it didn't change my mind that this is a conspiracy. Well, yeah, with this one, it's more which conspiracy do yeah. you lean more towards? And uh, Definitely. I lean to the back and to the left. JFK. Oh, but not, oh, yes. not, yeah, but it's a quote, it's a quote, it's a quote. For me, there was so much, like when I told my dad we were covering this case, he was like, there's no way you do that in one episode. Grassy Knoll. I was like, oh, well, we're going to try. We will do it in one episode. But- so there's a nickname for you. Yeah, there's no way you do that in one episode. Grassy Grassy Dale. Dale. <laughs> but no, I mean it's it's a fascinating one. It's it's more for me, and I think I'm gonna. I'm very intrigued to hear what you boys think. But for me, I I am. I think there's about four or five different conspiracies that make sense to me. But then in researching this case, the more conspiracies you read about, the more I'm kind of like, well, actually, that could make sense too. I'm unable to pick <laughs> with certainty which conspiracy I believe because I believe four or five, but then some of them start to contradict other conspiracies so i'm in a conspiracy spaghetti junction at the moment yes yeah, so like i said trying to make change, way out. changing your mind every minute yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah just a different live. way of saying I that it live this week i it live yeah I, I i'm not set on a particular one i've got a kind of way i'm leaning toward it but i want to kind of go through this and try and come to a conclusion by the end of the episode um but yes it's going to be a very interesting case as Ben's dad alluded to, it's a lot to go, get through, but um, obviously we condense it down into one episode, so we're not going to be able to go through every conspiracy theory. We're not going to be able to go into as much detail as perhaps is out there on certain bits of the detail. We might not be able to cover every single bit of detail, but we're going to cover the things we find particularly significant and interesting within the case, and also talk about the conspiracies and the alleged story of, of what actually did play out yeah. according to 
the the government. Yes, the US yeah, government. The official narrative. Exactly. Um, uh, but we'll we'll be having little shots of that ourselves. I think. Ooh. <laughs> And I've behaved myself this week because when we did sit down for the Diana episode, I think I had about 12 pages of just her childhood. Mm. So I've I'd been careful not to go. I got a bit obsessed, didn't I? A bit perverse, yeah. So a bit perverse. Oh, there were verses, but not no, perverse. Yeah, I heard. Yeah. Oh, you, you, you said verses. Well, we haven't actually said it, but today's case is the assassination of JFK. Also known as Who Shot JFK, The Murder of John F. Kennedy, The Kennedy Conspiracies, The John F. Kennedy Mystery, and American Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, because it happened on Elm Street. That's not actually one though, is it? Yeah. Nightmare on Elm Street. Because I swear we used that title for another episode. About I think it was six the of them, I think. Yeah. Menendez Brothers. And there's another one that's Nightmare on something. Uh, Chris Watts and American Nightmare. So, allow me to set the scene. Shortly after noon on the 22nd of November 1963, John F. Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States, was traveling along Elm Street, Dallas, Texas, in his unusually underprotected motorcade, when he was struck by at least two bullets that would become the center of mass conspiracy and controversy over the next 60 years. The bullets were enough to end the life of JFK, making him the fourth president to have been assassinated. But by a distance, under the most unclear and divisive of circumstances. Was this the work of the CIA, the FBI, the Pentagon? Could this have been conducted by the Mafia, the KGB, Lyndon Johnson, Fidel Castro? Were right-wing oil men to blame? Or was this simply the cause of one lone and possibly deranged gunman? In this episode, we are going to go through the backgrounds of John Fitzgerald Kennedy and Lee Harvey Oswald and how their paths came to meet on that fateful day. We are going to go through a detailed official timeline of events surrounding the assassination before moving on to the multiple conspiracies, the aftermath and the legacy of the case. It is a case that has divided opinion for almost 60 years and it's one that we are very excited to explore with you today. A quick note before we do go into the early lives of JFK and uh, less commonly regarded as LHO. Don't really hear it, do you? It's not, no, it's not it's, as catchy. That's no, not as catchy, no. You'll find that we spend a lot more time on Lee Harvey Oswald's background rather than JFK, despite obviously Kennedy living uh, an arguably far more eventful life. We have done this in order to really paint a clear picture on quote unquote the official narrative, and to do this we really need to understand exactly who Lee Harvey Oswald was, or who he was portrayed to have been, mm. which is quite a task in itself. It is, it is. Obviously, as we said before, you could do easily two hours on each of these people's at their timelines themselves but we're obviously gonna have to do a slightly shorter version and condense it down as much as we can to contain it into one neatly packaged finale it's a very neatly packaged finale i like i that. hope so yeah I hope there's no rips in the, in the wrapping paper and you can see some bits like, oh god you got me that i didn't want that <laughs> you kept the receipt <laughs> have they kept the receipt yeah good well I think so. So John Fitzgerald was born on May 29th, 1917 in Brookline, Massachusetts, which is just outside of Boston. He was born in the very famous Kennedy family home, number 83 Beale Street. John, who would go by Jack to his many family and friends, was one of nine children born into a wealthy and very politically connected family. His father was Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. and his mother was Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy, both of whom came from prominent Irish Catholic families. Joseph Kennedy Sr. was a highly successful businessman and politician and he was held in very high regard across the country. It has been speculated, I mean, this we could do a little, you talked about all the different timelines and spin-offs. We could do one on this guy because uh, there's a lot of speculation about how he made his fortune that oh. I found quite interesting, yeah. <laughs> Let's not do that though. No, no, no. no I'd rather not. Oh, we could do four or five hour episode. You can, why don't you record it? You send it over to me. Yeah. I might give it a go. Okay. Dan, what do you think of that? I wasn't listening, sorry. What's going on? <laughs> it's playing back, I'm, I'm, oh. I'm messaging the Discord group, sorry. Oh, no, no, that's fine. And on that, the Discord group is popping off, guys. ICMAP.co.uk, exclusive. I don't think Dan wanted that to keep that bit in. Well, Ponzi might surprise us. See how it edits, Ponzi. <laughs> So it's been speculated that Joseph Kennedy Sr. made his fortune predominantly by selling alcohol. Now, this is where the argument comes in. Did he do it legally, illegally? Was it during the Prohibition era? Did he have mafia ties? And mm. that's all going to come in later at the episode. But a mafia links, as um, well as ties. That... <gasps> Sorry? Mafia links. And then the ties you did. Sorry? No, don't put it on me. It was your bit. <laughs> no, I didn't do it, did I? <laughs> so basically, people argue that he made his fortune uh, illegally with help from the mafia. 
but a more detailed explanation of the Kennedy fortune is through Joseph initially being a saloon owner in Boston that eventually expanded to a whiskey importation business. He also then went on to make a number of highly profitable investments on stocks in Wall Street before entering the world of politics. Outside of work, which consumed most of his life, he was said to have been a highly affectionate but also quite strict father who would often spend weeks away from the family home. Joseph was a massively successful individual who was adamant that his family would follow in his footsteps and end up in distinguished positions, personally and or professionally. As we mentioned, he has amassed a large fortune through whiskey importation as a stock market and commodity investor and later decided to invest his profits extremely wisely in real estate and a wide range of independent businesses across the United States. Despite the onward appearance of the perfect all-American family, Joseph would regularly cheat on his wife and have numerous well-documented affairs with very prominent, very famous women, including actresses Marlene Dietrich and Gloria Swanson. The affair with Gloria Swanson was regarded as Hollywood's worst kept secret. Rose Kennedy was a philanthropist and socialite who put her children before anything else. She had met Joseph when the pair were teenagers attending a vacation home in Maine. The pair immediately fell in love with one another and would go on to date for several years, despite Rose's father... John Francis Fitzgerald's heavy disapproval of Joseph. He did not trust Joseph and viewed him as somebody who would not fully appreciate his daughter. The pair did not seem to worry too much about his disapproval, and as we mentioned, they would go on to get married and later have nine children together. Which I think if his uh, had disapproval of him, and then, well, we'll talk about affairs later, but I think he's a good judge of character, this John Francis Fitzgerald, just from those sentences I've read about him. Yeah. I really trust him. His judge of character. According to later speeches made by JFK, his earliest life memories involved accompanying his grandfather, John Fitzgerald, on various walking tours of historic sites in Boston. He was a very passionate Bostonian, and he even recalled discussions at the family dinner table about politics, which he claimed sparked his interest in history and public service. Jack, as we will refer to JFK for his childhood, was a great lover of the outdoors and any sport that he could get involved in. He loved football, golf, lacrosse, swimming and running. We said any sport Pretty much any sport, okay. not not specifically limited to golf, lacrosse, swimming and running, although he really loved those. Um, Do you love those ones in particular, hence you list them? Yeah, okay. yeah, really. Any sport kind of covers everything. You yeah. <laughs> don't need to list it. <laughs> and he co- <laughs> Fuck. God. He was also an avid member of the Boy Scouts. He was a very popular young man and had absolutely no trouble making new friends. He was also considered a very handsome young man and, as a result, had multiple girlfriends during his early life. As a child, Jack, who was the second oldest of nine Kennedy siblings, was very confident and very much considered the poster child of the Kennedy family. He was described as a charming and highly charismatic child who excelled in all things academic and athletic. He went on to attend private schools, including the esteemed Chout School in Connecticut, before later enrolling at Harvard University in 1936. He was considered a highly intelligent young man who was even deemed most likely to succeed in his yearbook. Jack's older brother Joe Jr. was already studying at Choate for two years before Jack's arrival and was a high-performing football player and leading student. Jack spent the majority of his first few years at Choate in his older brother's shadow and in order to deal with what he believed was his first real challenge in life, decided to counter this with rebellious behaviour that attracted attention and won over friends. These friends who would regularly pull outlandish pranks on other students and teachers formed a tight-knit group, each of whom would want to top the other's pranks. The group's most notorious stunt was exploding a toilet seat with numerous firecrackers. Bloody so, hell. Sounds very American, doesn't it? Yeah. When they did this, news travelled fast across the campus. In the next school assembly, the headmaster, George St. John, held the remains of the toilet seat up and claimed that whichever individuals were responsible for this were muckers who would spit in our sea. This resulted in Jack naming his group the Muckers Club. Who would spit in our sea. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people do a lot worse in the sea. They do. <laughs> That's why it's so salty, isn't it, Ben? Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Despite his privileged upbringing, Kennedy faced several health challenges as a child, including severe bouts of colitis, a disease that affects the colon, which doctors initially suspected was leukemia. He also had occasional bouts of scarlet fever. He also suffered from multiple back problems throughout his life, which were likely caused by a spinal injury he sustained whilst playing tennis at Harvard. So basically, he's having a good old game of tennis. You played before, can tell with that. Cheers, oh, yeah. Forehand. Dan's good at tennis. Oh, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Oh, yeah, baby. Big tennis boy. Have you been an instructor before? I taught it in America for a little bit, yeah. Yeah. But not on, not on UK soil. He doesn't like, he likes clay pitches, don't you, Dan, rather than grass? None of them. I prefer... Um, Asphalt. Yeah, wherever that one is. A flag? Is that a real thing? Asphalt tennis courts. I don't know what the official term is, actually, but... Nah, clay's horrible. So, yeah, they're having a good game, mm-hmm. and he's sort of over. 
overarched overextended yeah overextended and he claims to have said something has slipped in his back and in order to support with his pain and posture he would end up wearing multiple back braces for the majority of his life like people wear wrist things and they have a slightly bad wrist for the rest of life it's not well, like a de debilitating injury it's more just a kind of a, it's a nuisance kind of i mean i think f from what i understand he did have to go to hospital for a few days after this tennis accident i'm not undermining tennis at all i said you are no just sounded like I could have been snidey about tennis, and I'm not. I'd love to play. I'd love to have a go. Dan could teach you. Can you teach me, Dan? On the hard courts. Let's start on the made easy out, Made courts. out of acrylic. Dan, acrylic? Dan grew up on the hard courts. Yeah, boy. Yeah. Maybe Ben can start on the easy courts. That was my joke. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. Or the novice courts. Soft courts. Pathetic courts. <laughs> hey. He experienced a sudden pain in his lower right back and, and, and remarked, something has slipped. And he had to go to hospital for 10 days and then after that back brace for the rest of your life. Jack's childhood was also marked by tragedy. His older brother Joe Jr. was killed in World War II and his sister Kathleen died in a plane crash in 1948. We could do an entire episode on the Kennedy family curse as there's so much to it and tragedy seemed to follow the family wherever it went. There were car crashes, plane crashes, child deaths. This is like a shopping list the way you read that. There were car crashes, plane crashes, child deaths and all of these seemed to occur after the kennedy family opted to get rosemary kennedy jack's older sister after she displayed a series of emotional and behavioral difficulties some have linked to tendencies to the modern day bipolar disorder these experiences are said to have influenced kennedy's world view and his interest in public service so yeah there's there's so much to the 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 kennedy curse so many mm. people that have either died prematurely that is they called the dead kennedys the dead kennedys after after that kind I mean, of curse that would make sense wouldn't it i don't want to be ignorant but that would make sense. Too late. <laughs> no, nah, seriously, we don't know. We don't know. Hey, it makes sense. It? Yeah, yeah, a lot to that. But yeah, the, the family, although the outward appearance of a really all-American, privileged, high society family, yeah, there was a lot going on and a lot of uh, alleged curses following the family. As we mentioned, Jack had aspirations of attending Harvard and would make these intentions clear in his application letter, writing, The reasons I have for wishing to go to Harvard are several. I feel that Harvard can give me a better background and a better liberal education than any other university. I have always wanted to go there as I have felt that it is not just another college, but is a university with something definite to offer. Then too, I would like to go to the same college as my father. To be a Harvard man is an enviable distinction and one that I sincerely hope I shall attain. Jack's childhood and teenage years were shaped by his family's wealth and political prominence, as well as by the challenges he faced with his health and the tragedies he experienced within his family. These experiences undoubtedly played a role in shaping his character and his later career in politics. After graduating from Harvard, Jack got on to plan to study at Yale Law School. However, as World War II seemed more likely to require American intervention, he enrolled in the US Naval Reserve. Here, he performed exceptionally well despite his physical challenges. He was well liked amongst his peers and was said to have considered himself one of the boys. He also went on to command a US torpedo squadron. Jack went on to acquire numerous naval and military awards. Yeah, so as we said at the start of the episode, there's so much to his service in the military. I mean, We've condensed this to a paragraph, but there's so much that he did. Uh, and yeah, he had a very prominent military career. Jack then returned to America and took up work in journalism before forging a career in politics. Obviously, as we said again, we're going to condense a huge portion of history and a huge portion of his life into a couple of paragraphs. But he was immediately a standout member of the House of Representatives. During this time, he also met and married Jackie Onassis and the pair would go on to have four children together. As he has now transitioned into adulthood, we're going to refer to Jack as Kennedy or JFK moving forward and throughout the timeline. Kennedy was a member of the Democratic Party and a popular senator for Massachusetts at the time. He ran on a platform of youthful energy, progressivism and a commitment to social justice and civil rights. His campaign was marked by his charisma and excellent public speaking skills, which helped him to connect with voters and win their support. This gained him a significant amount of support, prompting him to run for president against Republican candidate Richard Nixon. Yeah, if you put their two voices next to each other, I think I prefer Kennedy's. Yeah, he sounds like Nixon's a, a good bit, guy. I rather quick. Speaks from the cheeks. I didn't know a ton about JFK before this episode, but I always remember hearing his voice in different speeches. I think he's here, is he? Well, there are clips of him in Forrest Gump, maybe. But I always remember he that. Meet, yeah, he meets Forrest Gump in, in the strong yeah. Bostonian accent. I love that accent. Mark Wahlberg. What accent were you doing there? I was just doing mine, but just okay. a bit more pronounced. Um, Mark Wahlberg. Boston. Boston. Bastard. How do you like them apple? No. Pack the cat, have it, yeah. Pretty good. Dan, nice Boston. I can't beat Dan. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, a very refreshing kind of political leader. He was um, said to have been obviously incredibly progressive, but very left-leaning. Um, so he was different to the norm at the time. Um, we're not going to get into kind of the politics of this all, but he was as popular as he was. Some of his ideas and, and speeches also gained a lot of detractors as well. A lot of people that thought he was changing too much too soon or wanted to change too much too soon. During the campaign, Kennedy also faced significant challenges, including concerns about his Catholic faith, his relative youth, uh, he was only 43 years old when he was elected, and his lack of experience in foreign policy. Despite these obstacles, Kennedy won a narrow victory over Nixon, winning 303 electoral votes to Nixon's 219, becoming the 35th president of America and also the youngest person to have assumed presidency by election. He was only 43 years old when he was inaugurated. So although he had some challenges, his presidency was also marked by significant accomplishments, including the creation of the Peace Corps, the Space Programme and the Civil Rights Act. I thought you'd like the Space Programme, Dan. Mm, yeah, boy. He showed me Venus the other day. I bet he did. Yeah, big time. We were... <laughs> We are in the hot tub together, and he said, look, that's Venus. And I looked up, and then... And you're like, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> However, he also attracted numerous enemies at the same time, for multiple different reasons. So the first one was the Bay of Pigs decision. So this was a failed attempt by US-backed and US-trained exiles to try and overthrow the Cuban government under Fidel Castro. So at the time, uh, President Eisenhower had authorised this operation. However, it became quite murky quite quickly. As this situation evolved and the exiles needed additional support from America, um, like physical support as well as financial support and air support, uh, JFK kind of went against the advice of uh, the CIA and decided to withdraw extra support from this, which caused him to... Well, essentially, he went against the advice of the CIA. Yeah. So JFK would basically not follow the CIA's advice, and they strongly believed that they needed to go big into this. And JFK is a bit of a pacifist, and he, 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 you know, when he could be peaceful, he would be peaceful. Um, so he strongly didn't want to do that. So he didn't um, give the additional support. And within doing this, created quite a few between him and the high up senior people in the CIA. And JFK got very infuriated with with the way they're behaving. And he famously would go on to say he wants to break up the CIA into a thousand pieces because of the way they behaved about this and going behind his back and trying to get things done. So from this instance, it's created a big rift between JFK and the CIA. And we know, obviously, from Diana Casey, for example, the CIA kind of, they be, they moved the beat of their own drum. Yeah. Um, they kind of just run things behind the scenes and don't really you know, need political approval for the things they do. So the second point is mafia and organised crime. JFK's brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, led a crackdown on organised crime during his tenure in office, which put him at odds with several powerful mafia figures. There were also allegations that JFK had connections to the mafia, which led to speculation about his involvement in organised crime. I mean, one thing we haven't talked about is he did sort of live... Uh, even before he was president, he lived a bit of a celebrity lifestyle. Mm. So he was kind of knocking boots with, I think there's, uh, well, there's a whole tangent we could go down with Marilyn Monroe, but he had a lot of celebrity friends. He is alleged to have been introduced to various key members of the mafia. Um, there, there are stories about his father obviously being involved with the mafia. So yeah, again, a lot of people that you don't necessarily want to get on the wrong side of. Yes. The third one is political opponents. JFK's presidency was marked by several contentious issues, including civil rights, the Cold War and the Cuban Missile Crisis. His stance on these issues often put him at odds with conservative politicians and groups. So Nixon, any chance Nixon had to kind of sling a bit of negative press towards JFK, he absolutely would do. And there were multiple opportunities for him to do that. The fourth one is personal scandals. JFK's personal life was often subject to scrutiny and scandal, including allegations of extramarital affairs, which made him a target for individuals and groups seeking to undermine his reputation and credibility. And then finally, we also have Cold War tensions. So JFK's confrontational stance towards the Soviet Union during the Cold War, as well as his decision to increase military involvement in Vietnam, made him a target for anti communist groups and individuals and it's notable that at least three of these five reasons jfk may have attracted enemies will factor into the individual we are about to discuss lee harvey oswald so we're now going to move on to lee harvey oswald's background uh, who is said to have been if you follow the official narrative the sole perpetrator of the assassination of jfk Many people believe him to be one of a group of people relating to it. Some people believe him to have absolutely no involvement whatsoever. But I think what's really interesting about his life stood next to JFK is there are a lot of very red flags here. 
quite literally as well. This is the part about this case I did not know as much about, and mm. I find his life absolutely fascinating. So, yeah, we're going to go into that now before our timeline. Lee Harvey Oswald was born on October 18th, 1939, at the French Hospital in New Orleans. He was the second son born to Marguerite and Robert Oswald Sr., having two older brothers, Robert Oswald Jr., and a half-brother called John Edward, whom Marguerite had from another relationship. Oswald's mother, Marguerite, had been described as a very cold, emotionally absent woman who showed very little affection or attention to her children. In later meetings with social workers, it was documented that Marguerite was a defensive, rigid, self-involved person who had real difficulty in accepting and relating to people. She also had very little understanding of her son's behaviours and of the protective shell he would later draw around himself. Interestingly, Robert Oswald Sr. was a third cousin of President Theodore Roosevelt and was also a distant cousin of General Robert E. Lee, who led the American Confederate Army. Robert Sr. lived quite a decorated life in the military and even served as a sergeant for the US Army during World War I. Unfortunately, Lee Harvey Oswald would never meet his father. Oswald's father, Robert, passed away just two months before he was born as the result of a heart attack. This left the Oswald household without a strong male role model, which we tend to see in a lot of the other cases we've covered with a marriage breaking down or, or a broken home. The Oswald boys begin to act out against their mother and the dynamic of the household begins to deteriorate very, very quickly. So after Oswald was born, Marguerite placed the two older boys into an orphanage and attempted to raise Oswald by herself. She worked as an assistant at dressmakers and would regularly work long hours most days of the week. Unable to cope, she placed Oswald into the same orphanage as his brothers for a year just before he turned three years old. Oswald had to teach himself how to make his own food and look after himself as his mother was incredibly absent and often left him to his own devices. So Ben was saying earlier about how he'd, he'd have to make his own sandwiches. He lived off them. Yeah. Lived, I don't mind a sandwich, but not every day. Really? Uh, I, love a I like breakfast sandwiches. They're my thing. A nice breakfast sandwich. Big fan of toast. Yeah. Toasties? Yeah. Yeah, more admin though, isn't it? It is a bit more admin, yeah. In 1944, when Oswald was just four years old, Marguerite made the decision to move the family from New Orleans to Dallas, Texas. Here, Oswald enrolled in several different local schools as he went from first to sixth grade. He didn't go from straight from first all the way up to sixth. In fact, he was quite the opposite. But he was what, basically he from sixth to first. No, sorry, basically just oh, sorry. You know, not the exact opposite, I guess. <laughs> I, should have, I should have specified. So it's not entirely clear why he was moved between so many different schools, but many have speculated it was due to poor behaviour and attendance issues. So we're going to go into talk about how often his mother moves him around the country, how often he makes the decision later in life to move around the world. Um, but yeah, a common factor here is that he very rarely stays in one place for an extended period of time. Whilst Oswald struggled very much socially at school, most of his studies came naturally to him. He performed well academically and achieved an IQ of 104 in the fourth grade. The average was around 100, so just above average there. Apparently, he was one of the best in class for reading and one of the worst in class for spelling. He just yeah. thought they'd go hand in hand. From an early age, Oswald was notably shy and withdrawn, with many commenting that the child seemed absent and cold. He also started to act out if he didn't get his way and would often run away from home. This is something that would repeat itself regularly throughout Oswald's life. A childhood social worker commented, I remember him vividly. He was this skinny, unprepossessing little kid who was not a mentally disturbed kid. As a matter of fact, his IQ was better than average. He was just emotionally frozen. He was a kid who had never really developed a trusting relationship with anybody. When Oswald turned 11, his mother again moved the family across the country. This time, she moved them from Dallas to the Bronx, New York, where Oswald would attend the seventh grade. Again, Oswald found it really difficult to adjust and really difficult to commit to his social life and studies. He began to regularly play truant and very rarely attended any of his classes. This is where it gets quite, quite interesting. As is a common theme with Oswald, he spent large parts of his early life skipping school and began spending as much of his time as possible at the Bronx Zoo. Mm -hmm. A young Oswald seemed to prefer spending his time with the zoo animals rather than people. Shortly before his 12th birthday, he was arrested for truancy whilst at the zoo and placed into a juvenile facility. What are zoo doing here? He had been skipping school and attending the zoo for almost two months straight. Two months. Uh, I'd get bored after one day, not a month. So yeah, so uh, as a result of him being placed into this juvenile facility, he was analysed by a psychiatrist. And it is alleged strongly that his mother was aware that the boy wasn't attending school, but did very little to reprimand him. Oswald was analysed by Dr. Renatus Hartogs, which I just thought was a great name, who made the following observations of a young Oswald. The boy is immersed vividly in a fantasy life, turning around the topics of omnipotence and power, 
through which he tries to compensate for his present shortcomings and frustrations. Oswald demonstrates a personality pattern disturbance with schizoid features and passive-aggressive tendencies. Oswald has to be seen as an emotionally quite disturbed youngster who suffers under the impact of really existing emotional isolation and deprivation, lack of affection, absence of family life and rejection by a self-involved and conflicted mother. Because that's the point as well. He's never met his dad. Mm. His mum is not there really for him whatsoever. His brothers have been placed into care. He's had literally no family dynamic or any kind of stable upbringing whatsoever. Yeah, been moved whatsoever. around from pillar to post. Dr. Hartog's made the recommendation for Oswald to be placed on probation on the condition that he attended a child guidance clinic and also sought psychological support from a counsellor. It is here that he met social worker Eveline Siegel, who interviewed both Oswald and his mother Marguerite several times. She said, she said the following of a young Oswald. There is a rather pleasant appealing quality about this emotionally starved, affectionless youngster which grows as one speaks to him. Though he has detached himself from the world around him because no one in it ever met any of his needs for love, he feels very little care or affection from his mother and never met his father. He just felt that his mother never gave a damn for him. He also felt like a burden that she simply just had to tolerate. Man. It's horrible, isn't it? It's, it's, he's been for a really shitty childhood. Mm. From this, it's clear that Oswald had a highly unorthodox childhood, or, or shitty, with no sense of family or belonging. He was never shown any affectionate from his cold, emotionally absent and socially awkward mother, and he never met his father, unlike his older brothers, whom he relied on for their descriptions and memories of their father. He was also a loner who had no friends and also became distant from his own brothers. Though he was not violent in any way and did not commit crimes other than playing truant from school, his early behaviours were described by Dr. Hartogs as a sign of violent but silent protests against his neglect by his mother and represents his reaction to a complete absence of any real family life. Sounds like he's just been fine. <laughs> I knew that was going. <laughs> violent but silent protests. They, silent. Are, they are the most violent ones. Silent but violent. Yeah. Despite possibly having a reading spelling disability, one of Oswald's great passions was reading. He would read books whenever he had spare time and would regularly be found in public libraries. The books, for him, were a form of escapism, but he also soaked up any knowledge that he could get from them. Before he turned 15 years old, he considered himself a socialist. According to his diary, I was looking for a key to my environment and then I discovered socialist literature. I had to dig for my books in the back dusty shelves of libraries. As he grew into his teenage years, Oswald would continue to skip school, this time preferring to spend time at museums and public libraries, whilst also becoming fascinated with the New York underground system, attempting to memorise and travel the entire city and surrounding areas alone. His repeated and continued absence from school caused teachers to alert social workers who, in turn, notified police in hopes that Oswald would be removed from his mother's care in order to complete his education in a home for troubled boys. As soon as Oswald's mother got wind of this, Oswald's behaviour and attendance drastically improved before the family very quickly moved back to New Orleans in the winter of 1954. This all happened before a trial regarding custody of Oswald could even take place. So that's quite smart. You know you're probably about to lose your final child to, to the care system, and so instead you t tell him to up his behaviour for a month and then move to a different city. Well, she doesn't seem like she really wants him anyway, so then she goes... Yeah, she's a, yeah, a strange individual. Is she... She's a very curious individual. You said strange before that. Yeah, no, but that didn't make it in. Oh. We yeah, are a strange individual. Oswald completed the 8th and 9th grade in New Orleans before dropping out of school just a couple of months into 10th grade. He then took up work as an office clerk and messenger, though he was described as being very socially awkward when working in these roles. His mother then moved the family to Fort Worth, Texas a few months later, where Oswald attempted to re-enroll for the 10th grade, but dropped out once again after attending for only a few weeks. It is important to note that before Oswald had even turned 17, he had lived in 22 different locations, attending 12 different schools. His family life and social life were both completely non-existent, which you could argue forced him even further into the fantasy world of his yeah you can imagine it's like matilda when she was a she you know she went to the library she got lost in her books yeah she would live in a different life in the books and you can imagine oswald doing the similar thing but probably less cheery music in the background yeah haunting tones in the background um, away. Um, away. a bit more like him like, mm. <laughs> okay 
At age 17, Oswald enrolled in the Marines. Because of his age and lack of father, his older brother Robert Jr. was required to sign off as his legal guardian, permitting him to join. It is widely believed that Robert Jr. did this in order to get Oswald away from the rule of their mother and to begin living a life of his own. In the Marines, Oswald was predominantly working in radar operation, which required a security clearance and also gave him access to highly confidential information and data. He was also trained and tested in shooting, as is the case with any Marine. But this is something that Oswald became infatuated with. In December of 1956, Oswald scored 212, which was slightly above the requirements for the designation of sharpshooter. However, three years later, his score dropped to 191, which reduced him to the rank of marksman. Whilst in the Marines, Oswald spent time in America, Japan and the Philippines. Oswald was given the nickname Aussie Rabbit after the cartoon character. I wasn't I wasn't familiar with this cartoon character. Ah, uh, maybe but, you didn't grow up in the 50s and 60s. Well, no, I didn't, no. Well, see, it's me being nice to you. It is, yeah. There you go. I thought you were trying to trap me. No. Oh, oh, Aussie Rabbit under my foot. Oh, there he is. So yeah, I couldn't tell when I had a little look at this Aussie Rabbit cartoon. Mm. I couldn't tell if it was a compliment or not based on the type of character that Aussie Rabbit is. Because visually, they don't look similar at all. But it is said that in his late teens, he was quite... Although Oswald, if you see photos of him, he's quite small and quite skinny. Mm. As a teen in the Marines, he was quite bulky. And apparently that's why they called him Aussie the Rabbit. So as well as Aussie Rabbit, his peers also began calling him... Oswaldskovich, due to the fact that they had regularly heard him speaking pro-Russian and pro-communism statements, which is definitely at that time, in that location, not something that you wanted to be doing around fellow Americans, but they seemed to be kind of making light of it. I think it was the fact that he was always had his books, always yeah. had like Russian literature, always trying to learn. He couldn't speak it very well, but they would either call him Aussie Rabbit or Oswaldskovich. Oswald was later court-martialed after accidentally shooting himself in the elbow with an unauthorised handgun. Ouch elbow why'd you do that if you do it by accident you know, i suppose oh, imagine if you itch and you're like, oh, <laughs> oh fucking itch deep itch <laughs> oh the itch is gone something else to fix here's something for you i had the hiccups the other day oh. real bad 45 minutes like oh a non-stop. case of the hiccups i don't know if it's a case i'm trying to make it through crime i just had yeah, I, I just had hiccups and then i had a spoonful of peanut butter done a few days later my wife had the hiccups she did the same thing stopped it again so if you had the hiccups was it smooth or crunchy i i think it was smooth well i had smooth but i think it probably worked with either oh. top tip for you peanut butter is digested slowly by the body and the slow process of digestion changes your breathing and swallowing pattern this causes the vagus nerve to react differently to adapt to new patterns eliminating hiccups whoa very good. If that doesn't work for you, try breathing into a paper bag, but do not put the bag over your head. Pull up your knees into your chest and lean forward like a bomb. <laughs> Sip some ice cold water, swallow granulated sugar. I've already given you the resolution of it, so just do well, that. Well, yeah, but if it doesn't work. No, it does work. So Bite on a work. lemon, taste vinegar, or just hold your breath for ages. Breath doesn't work at all. And that's from the NHS. Yeah, well, they're wrong. I can only breath for two Peanut minutes. Peanut butter, that's You can. You yeah. can. Yeah, we did a little... Um, well, it's a, it's a tangent, but we did a we had a hot tub sort of party, and that very quickly turned into how long can each of us hold our breath underwater? And Dan is suspiciously um, he's good. Why <laughs> <Not> suspicious? <laughs> just got good lungs, mate. Yeah, I just feel like you've been deep practicing for something. I try and make it cocksuckery. No, I wasn't trying to make it sure. cocksuckery. No, I wasn't. You went something. No, I meant like an underwater like mission, reconnaissance mission. Mission. <laughs> So Oswald was court-martialed a second time for fighting one of his sergeants whom he believed to be responsible for his punishment in the shooting matters. I mean, just leave it there, mate. I still can't get over the elbow thing, because that's even harder to touch. T- you know, you can touch my elbow, it's fine without a gun, but with a gun. I mean, I made up the idea that he doing it because he had it itchy. That was not true. Yeah, I know, but how else would you, by accident, I'm just trying to, even if you're trying to holster it quickly, it's not, they're not like in the lines of normal body movements, are they? You're, you have to go out of your way what to if, do you. What if it's there? Oh, what was he going to like tie his shoe up? No, the holster there. Oh, yeah, he's got it. He's got it straight away. Or the old do put put hold your gun there like a loaf of bread to do your shoes up. Who's holding a loaf of bread there? (laughs) French stick, if that. Yeah, but not a bread stick. Not a loaf of. Well, had a loaf of bread because you bake your baker roots, I guess. Yeah, you baker roots. Thanks, man. Oswald was also later punished for a third and slightly more bizarre incident. Whilst he was on nighttime sentry duty in the Philippines, he inexplicably fired his rifle into the jungle. 
which uh, he's a strange guy he, with a gun, as we'll, as we'll go on. To. As a result of this, he was demoted from private first class to just private and was also briefly imprisoned for his actions. Whilst imprisoned and whilst on base, Oswald began to teach himself basic Russian and slowly began to warm to their way of life. Feeling disillusioned with America and becoming somewhat of a sympathiser to then communist Russia, Oswald concocted a plan. He pleaded for a hardship discharge. Hmm. That's a bit naughty, isn't it? Hardship discharge. Doesn't sound very PG. <clears throat> he pleaded for a hardship discharge from the Marine. I can tell you're <laughs> fucking staring at me. <laughs> I have to look that up. He pleaded for a hardship discharge from the Marines due to the fact that he claimed his mother needed him to become her carer. She never cared for him. That's exactly right. And I thought that was extremely out of character given his feelings towards his mother. Unless he was going to purposely be a bit annoying. Like when she wanted some squash. He'd shoot hot her water. in the elbow. No, hot water. I was going to say. Yeah. But yeah, shooting the elbow could be another thing he did. If she had hiccups just getting rid of all the peanut butter. Thrown out the window. Smart. Fuck off, bitch. Because <laughs> she's been a bad parent. Hmm. So yeah, very peculiar given his uh, relationship with his mother. However, on September the 11th, 1959, he was granted this and returned home to Fort Worth. Just a month later, however, Oswald travelled to the Soviet Union via trips through England and Finland in order to start a new life there. So, yeah, that leads you to kind of question just how much care did your mother need when a month later you're Ofsky? To Rofsky. At age 20, Oswald was now living in Soviet Russia, barely able to speak the language and surviving off of $1,500 he had saved during his time as a Marine, equivalent to roughly $11,000 nowadays. So that's good. Yeah, do all right for that, okay. All right, that, yeah. Yeah, go to the coffee shops, yeah. see what's going on. Really soaking the atmosphere. Yeah. As soon as he arrives, he informs his tour guide that he's a US citizen and wishes to defect in order to become a Soviet citizen. Unsurprisingly, the tour guide says, why are you telling me that? I'm a tour guide. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> Unsurprisingly, the tour guide found it really hard to understand what Oswald was saying and so left him to it. He kept repeating the phrase, great Soviets. Everywhere, great Soviets. Great Soviets. Oh, really great Soviets around here. Oh, I would love that. I would love to be part of this union. US, <coughs> US bad. Oh, Soviets good. Stinky in the US. <laughs> US nay. Russia hey. Russia hey. Forever. Basically, he made his way. He got to Southampton, then made his way through France and ended up in Helsinki and then crossed the border quite suspiciously into Russia. Me that's, thinking, that's, yeah. yeah. But in order to get in, they still granted him a very short length visa. I think he had about a month on it. So with his visa due to expire and his tour guides being very aware of his visa, Oswald made the decision to try and end his life in his hotel bathroom by making a small cut to his left wrist whilst in the bathtub. Moments before his tour guides were due to arrive, Basically, my understanding of this is he knew they were coming. This was one of his last days on his visa. They weren't understanding what he was saying by saying, I, I want to be a great Soviet, oh, you know, US, no. So he decided another way of trying to convince them to allow him to stay in the country. So he's, he's made... He wants sympathy a bit. It he, was, was, he wasn't actually trying to kill himself. It was more kind of yeah, sympathy exactly. to try and gain from that. Exactly. So as a result, when the tour guides arrived, they found him in quite a bad way. They took him to hospital and this extended his stay and he was kept under psychiatric observation in Moscow for another couple of weeks. Here, he pleaded with numerous Soviet officials to allow him to become a Soviet citizen. They did not allow this to happen and so Oswald made quite a, a brave decision to go to the US embassy in Moscow and tell them directly that he no longer wished to be a US citizen and that, in his words, he was through. I mean, there are rumours that he took his passport there and kind of left it on the table and said, you know, see you later. I don't know how much of that is true, but he was very kind of arrogant in his kind of conversations with the embassy. No, no Oswald, come back. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, America changed Oswald's military hardship status to undesirable, and so he began living in Russia. Over the next few years, he worked and studied in Minsk, Belarus. He was provided with government-funded living quarters and kept under constant surveillance. Years later, he met Ella German... I'm going to surprise you here, a Belarusian co-worker who seemed to take pity on Oswald. She did not love him, but wanted to get to know him better as she viewed him as more gentle and approachable than the local men. The pair went on several dates, but when Oswald proposed to Ella, she declined. This seemingly sparked a change in Oswald, who had fallen out of love with a life in communist Eastern Europe and now wanted to return to the US. Okay, crawling back. Yeah, which is awkward. As oh, actually, I really like the stars and stripes. <laughs> Imagine if it was the same embassy member that he's been all very... My evil twin came in last week, so I'll bow to America. Oh, I really love it. I really love it. Go next. Get my passport. Can I... What about mine? <laughs> he wrote in his diary in January of 1961, I am starting to reconsider my desire about staying. 
The work is drab, the money I get is nowhere to be spent, no nightclubs or bowling alleys, no places of recreation except the trade union dances. I have had enough. Before returning to America, Oswald married a young lady named Marina Prusakova, and the pair had a daughter called June. Oswald was granted permission to return to the US, but was ordered to pay $435 in reparations. So it has been, I saw some arguments say, stating that the fact that he now had a child also kind of he leveraged that to get back to America mm. and so yeah they've despite all the awful things he's said about America and been spouting about America they've they've allowed him back so having returned to America Oswald settled in Dallas and held a series of short lasting jobs for which he either quit or was fired from for unknown reasons throughout this period he would continue to read and write pro-Soviet materials and he even began writing a manuscript on Soviet life Oswald then uses the alias A. Hidel to purchase a second-hand Kakano rifle. He also purchased a revolver using the same document. Using these weapons, Oswald allegedly attempted to assassinate General Edwin Walker, an outspoken anti-communist American war veteran. Whether Oswald was known to have done this or not is speculation. However, it is widely believed that Oswald fired his Kakano rifle at General Walker through a window from less than 100 feet away as Walker was sat at his desk in his Dallas home. The single bullet struck the window frame and Walker's only injuries were bullet fragments to the forearm. No suspects were ever provided to or by the police, and the only evidence pointing to Oswald are claims made by his wife, Marina. So yeah, this document, this A. Hiddell, it's Alec James Hiddell, and literally he's just stuck a photo over it. It's like, I'm looking at photos of it now. It's so easy to forge a document in the uh, early 60s. He's literally just... Super bad would be a very different film yeah. there, wouldn't oh, it? Oh, it absolutely would, Tom. Super easy. <laughs> Super easy. Over the next couple of years, Oswald would live between Fort Worth, Dallas and New Orleans, also spending some time in Mexico trying to gain entry to Cuba. A very similar pattern emerged much like his childhood. He was always living and working in different locations, predominantly moving on due to being fired. So yeah, there are loads of different roles that he held for a number of weeks. and almost Is he a baker as well? <laughs> probably held them well not under that elbow because he shot it off but yeah everywhere he went he seemed to be dismissed for the just most petty of reasons mm. whilst in new orleans oswald was fired from his job as a machinery greaser for the riley coffee company and i quote because his work was not satisfactory and because he spent too much time loitering in adrian alba's car garage next door where he read rifle and hunting magazines surprisingly got fired for reading rifle magazines <laughs> And shortly after this, he was also arrested for disturbing the peace when on August 9th, he turned up in downtown New Orleans handing out pro-Fidel Castro leaflets with the title Hands Off Cuba. So this was his writing, his own work. Tensions are extremely high at this time. And there are photos of him handing out these, uh, these uh, leaflets that he's made. There's uh, some video footage as well. There is some video footage as well. Uh, so, yeah. During this time as well, when he was arrested for disturbing the peace, he was part of the Fair Play for Cuba uh, committee. After this, in October of 1963, Oswald returned to Dallas, where he was recommended a role at the Texas School Book Depository by a neighbor. Oswald was given and started the role immediately. Despite the low $1.25 an hour rate, he claimed that he needed the money to support his growing family. Oswald and Marina had their second daughter, Audrey, just one month before a day that would change the world forever. It was here in Dallas, just one month later, that Oswald would go on to become one of the most famous men in the world. It is here that we move to the timeline of the assassination of JFK. So with the timeline, what we're going to do is first of all present the official narrative, so the official timeline, uh, and then we're going to go into the conspiracies and the aftermath. 22nd of November 1963. 7.30am. Lee Harvey Oswald makes his way to work with a friend and colleague named Buell Wesley Frazier. <laughs> the names kept coming. Buell Wesley Frazier. Come on, come on, Buell Wesley Frazier. <laughs> Oswald had only been working at the Texas School Book Depository in Dallas for approximately a month before he would go on to use the workplace for assassination. Under his arm, he carries a paper-covered parcel. When Frazier asked what the package contained, Oswald replies, Oh, just some curtains. 11.30 a.m. President John Kennedy and his wife Jackie land in Dallas, Texas. When they arrive, they are met with a swarm of citizens and paparazzi. 
The president was visiting Dallas as a sign of unity amid an ongoing feud between Lyndon B. Johnson and the people of Texas. At the time, President Kennedy was losing votes that he couldn't afford to lose in his re-election campaign as Johnson had become his vice president, leaving his position in Texas Senate. Visiting Texas was meant to be an opportunity to reclaim the support they needed from the Texans. So as well, at the time, they'd very recently lost a child together as well, uh, John and Jackie, and it was rumoured whether Jackie would be there or not as she was still recovering from this, but the fact that she was present, I mean, she was a celebrity in her own right, um, the fact that she was present um, for this motorcade made it, you know, all the more reason for the people to come out and see her. 11.45 a.m. President Kennedy, his wife Jackie, and Texas Governor John Connolly and his wife all make their way into a limousine. The unroofed vehicle was accompanied by security on motorbikes. Lyndon B. Johnson and his wife ride in a separate car nearby. So normally there'd be like what well, they describe it as a bubble, but it's not really spherical. It's like a Is it like when Homer designs a car? It's very much like Homer when Homer designs a car, but a bit more square instead of circular. Bit more trivia but, here. When Homer designs the car, yeah. who voices his brother? Danny DeVito. Great. Good knowledge. Thank you, sir. Like the bubble, it's not a, when you say bubble. Well, I when say I bubble. say bubble, yeah. it sounds really round. But yeah, it's, it's a square, right. square sort of bubble. The other day, you know when you hit your head and see stars? Yeah. My wife said the other day she hit her head and saw bubbles, and I thought that's quite cute. Oh. So they do look more. Yeah. I've never heard it before, so. 12 p.m., the motorcade is in full swing. Kennedy is greeted by streets filled with people hoping to catch a glimpse of their president. At midday, the cars are making their way through downtown Dallas. It's been estimated that 150,000 people were out that day to watch Kennedy and the motorcade, which I don't think you'd get, well, definitely wouldn't get with Trump and it wouldn't get with Biden. Maybe Obama, he probably would have got it, perhaps. Yeah. But um, yeah, he was very much the kind of the people's president. Um, and as Ben said, he was, he was kind of crossing the lines a bit with celebrity as well as being the president. 12.29 p.m. Nellie Connolly, the wife of John Connolly, turns to John F. Kennedy and remarks, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. JFK replies, no, you certainly can't. Arrogant. <laughs> A minute later, the president would be fatally shot. 12.30 p.m. As the motorcade is making his way through Dealey Plaza, John F. Kennedy is shot three times. Officially, the first bullet missed. The second bullet went through Kennedy and landed in John Connolly's thigh. This has become known as the magic bullet. We'll go on to the magic bullet theory later on. It's rather preposterous. A third bullet is then fired and this one enters the head of the president. This shot is fatal. The events are all caught on tape by Abraham Zapruder and this tape is now known as the Zapruder tape, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, Jackie Kennedy is heard crying. They have killed my husband. His brains are on my hands. So the Sapruda footage is very grainy, but you can still make, make things out quite clear. It would certainly clearly yeah. enough. I mean, it, it was naively, I was like, oh, surely a few people were filming, but back then, not, yeah. not really there available. Are, in that footage, you can see a lot of people kind of holding devices, but who mm. is filming, who's not filming, who's taking photos? Well, if, well, it was, well, if it was nowadays, a million iPhones on them. Yeah, everywhere. And other phones are available. Google phone, Pixel, great phone. Very good camera. And slow-mo. Which, and slow -mo. Oh. Yeah, which would have been... But uh, yeah, so uh, Jackie is sat next to JFK. She initially, when the first uh, shot enters his neck, you can kind of see him kind of mm. grasp at his neck. And she's looking straight at him when the second, yeah. well, the third shot, but the second one that hits him. It is so, even though obviously it's someone being shot in the head, the uh, footage is so graphic, isn't it? Yeah. It's I've really never shitty. seen anything quite like yeah. that. Um, I mean, his head essentially explodes. Mm. And she's looking straight at him. She's within a... I mean, how she didn't get shot as well. She is within a, a yard of him. So, yeah, Jackie has seen this all firsthand, extremely graphic murder of her husband. And you see her then kind of retreat to the, to the kind of rear bonnet of the vehicle. But she claims that she was actually trying to collect bits of his brain matter and skull, mm. which is just a horrendous thought to imagine. But her view of that murder is just i mean to watch the footage is hard but she's literally sat next to it as it happens and the other thing to know is the car is full of obviously obviously people witnessing what's happened and where you know in theory where the bullet has come from obviously jackie's looking directly at him and that's gonna be a big debate later on in terms of which direction the bullets came from how many were shot and obviously the servicemen the fbi who were around him as well who witnessed it would have a lot to say about that as well immediately people are sent into a panic and disperse from the scene at first, many thought it may have been a firecracker, but when more shots were heard, they knew to flee. Clinton Hill, who was a Secret Service agent at the time of the assassination, runs and jumps onto the back of the limousine, carrying the president and his guests. Unfortunately, before he could get to the president, I mean, he's trying to, to protect him after he hears the very first shot. By the time he actually reaches the car is when the fatal shot to JFK's head 
happens. So he was, yeah, he was, he even to date blames himself for not getting there on time and says, I should have taken that bullet. But yeah, he wasn't able to get there in time, unfortunately. I mean, he wouldn't even know where it's coming from. Would he? So once authorities are made aware via radio calls that the president has been shot, they are given orders to go into buildings and try to find the perpetrator. This included the Texas school depository. Lee Harvey Oswald was confronted by a police officer, but when the building superintendent told him that Oswald was a staff member, he was able to casually walk away. Staff reported that he behaved normally and brought a coke before making his way home. Being set free, he makes his way back to his lodgings in Oak Cliff. Once at home, he puts on a different coloured jacket and then roams the streets. 12.45pm, Robert Kennedy receives the news that his brother has been shot. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover emotionlessly told Kennedy, I have news for you, the president's been shot. He added, I think it is serious, I am endeavouring to get the details, I'll call you back when I find out more. 1 p.m. After the shooting, the president was immediately taken to Parkland Hospital. When he arrived, it was clear the doctors would not be able to save him. His skull had fractured and this caused his brain to be severely impaired. It was not just JFK's blood that was left on his wife, but brain matter as well. With it being clear that JFK was so close to death, Jackie uh, is adamant that a Catholic priest is summoned in order to present the last rites. Jackie held her husband's hands dearly as he drew his last breath. Earl Rose, the Dallas County Medical Examiner, told JFK's entourage that Texas state law required an autopsy to take place in the county where the crime has been committed. This law was neglected as there was no federal law in place which stated the procedure to be followed in the event of an assassination for president. This coupled with a distressed Mrs. Kennedy, who refused to leave her husband's side, meant that JFK's body was flown back to Washington DC on Air Force One. So this would be something that people would take a lot of issue with. This mm-hmm. was, you know, is legal to take his body out of the state, even though obviously it doesn't specifically say about a president being assassinated. Obviously Obviously within that time, you know, you want people to, it's essentially evidence, it's people looking at the body directly and as we're going to discuss, doctors and nurses within Texas will have a lot different ideas and opinions on the body than people will do in Washington. At 1.15pm, Lee Harvey Oswald would commit his second slaying of the day. When patrolman J.D. Tippett spotted a man fitting the description of the assassin, he approached the suspect in his car. After getting out of his car, Tippett was fatally shot in the chest three times and once in the head. This shooting was seen by 12 witnesses and later six would confirm that it was Oswald they had seen shoot J.D. Tippett. So they had a very minor description. Basically, people claim to have seen a man hanging out uh, the book depository window that matched Oswald's appearance. But from that high up and that far away, there were a lot of conflicting uh, kind of accounts on what the the shooter looked like but when Tippett has been shot there's obviously first-hand witnesses that can give a much more accurate and reliable description. 1:22 p.m. continuing their search for the assassin police are still following orders to search local buildings to look for a gunman. Police search the Texas school book depository and when they reach the sixth floor they find a rifle and three bullet casings on the floor next to a window that looks directly over the motorcade. At 1.30pm, Oswald knows that the police are searching for him. His altercation with patroller J.D. Tippett proved to him that they knew what the killer looked like. He becomes panicked when walking the streets of Dallas as he hears a procession of police sirens. This is when he decides to take cover inside a movie theatre. One of the theatre staff members sees Oswald, who has entered the building without buying a ticket, and calls the police after being concerned about his suspicious behaviour. 1.33pm, it has become public knowledge to all those in America and around the world that President Kennedy has been shot to death. The assistant White House press secretary announces the news. The press and media are covering the story as new pieces of information come to life. I mean, Oswald as well, if this official narrative is to be believed, if let's say he fired all of the shots and you are aware now you've killed the president, a very popular president Mm. of that, he's very calm initially in his exit of that building and getting changed and then going back out to the public. But then to act the way he did, to shoot someone that's approaching him, Yeah. I mean, there might have been more to that situation than just he got out of the car and started shooting him. And then to enter a, a, a cinema without paying for a ticket. Yeah, if you just pay for a ticket, then yeah. yeah. Or just got out of, if you're sat in a car, why not get out of, well, and I assume the cinema thing is maybe he's trying to force an alibi. Yeah, That's true, because if you're not buying a ticket, then he can go in and halfway through a film and say he was there. Yeah. But yeah, because I was thinking that, why doesn't he just drive somewhere else, especially at that time, you know, as you mentioned earlier, how easy is a forged document. And this is a tricky one, um, but yeah, he's, he, could, he could be acting... As you said, if you bought a ticket, perhaps, oh, I don't know. He's, yeah. he's not doing well to keep himself under, under wraps. Yeah, exactly. 1.45pm, Oswald is sitting in the movie theatre watching a screening of the movie War Is Hell. He is startled when 15 police officers come into the showing and arrest him. He allegedly shouts, it's all over now. 
He denies that he is the one who shot both JFK and patrolman JD Tippett. He resists arrest and four police officers are needed in order to overpower him. At 2.30 p.m., Lee Harvey Oswald is taken into questioning and he continues to deny his involvement. Testing has been done on Oswald which shows that he has gunpowder residue on his person. Furthermore, Oswald's wife had confirmed that the gun found on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository did belong to her husband. Oswald vehemently denied the allegations that faced him and even claimed that photographic evidence of him with a series of guns was faked. So I've seen those pictures that he's saying, because the pictures of him holding a gun, yeah. but then if you look at the other one, he said that's my face but not my body. And then the ring on his hand is on the other hand. Ah, okay. It does kind of look a bit doctored and I think the gun that was found very slight detail in terms of where um, I think where the strap was held um, it was different to the one he ordered so the comparisons between the actual gun found at the scene to what his gun was it wasn't the same gun there's very slight differences between and measurements between where certain aspects of the gun is so um, could have been doctored <laughs> yeah it's, I, the, I feel like the gun isn't the gun isn't the gun that also I bought then mm -hmm. the picture of him holding that gun particularly is the one that seems doctored from the things uh, I've seen, but obviously it depends on what documentary you watch and what podcast you listen to, doesn't it, with a lot yeah. of these things, but I could see the point from that. Um, the other really weird thing about this moment is they're questioning him, and I think they go on to question him for around 12 and a half hours. Yeah. No notes are made. There's no recordings that are available of this. There's no. There's nothing yeah. taken from the 12 and a half hours, so it's very, very sketchy. When you watch things and you see him like coming out and saying, I'm innocent, I'm inno innocent, I'm almost like, pleasantly surprised by the sound quality and everything like that yeah. of, of the footage just like they had every means to be able to record the whole thing and yeah. do all that stuff especially with such breaking news and, but yeah it's very suspicious how they wouldn't look to kind of note anything down 2.38pm only around an hour and a half after the pronounced death of JFK Lyndon B. Johnson becomes America's next president he is sworn in on the same Air Force One that had flown JFK to Dallas that morning next to him is Jackie Kennedy still wearing her pink blood splattered clothing from the incident so she had to be present for this uh, this swearing in of Lyndon B. Johnson and she's just just looks completely bewildered by the whole I mean, it's moment. It's mad why they haven't like given her a change of clothes or something yeah. or, you know I mean she's literally covered in her to see his husband's blood and brain matter is, is, is a horrible image. So following on from what I just said there, apparently she was offered multiple times to change her clothes but she's been quoted saying oh no that's alright I want them to see what they've done to Jack. 2.47pm, the plane makes its departure from Dallas and heads to Washington, D.C. Despite being in a state of shock, Jackie immediately makes plans for her husband's funeral. While she is doing this, the new president, Lyndon B. Johnson, talks and makes plans with his advisors. At 7pm, Air Force One arrives in Maryland. Once President Lyndon B. Johnson stepped outside of the plane, he is hit by the press and media who all wanted a statement. In a short statement, Johnson addresses the nation, saying, This is a sad time for all people. We have suffered a loss that cannot be weighed. For me, it is a deep personal crisis. I know that the world shares the sorrow that Mrs. Kennedy and her family bear. I will do my best, that is all I can do. I ask for your help and God's. At 7.05 p.m., JFK's family are still in a deep state of shock and disbelief. Robert Kennedy, JFK's brother, greets his sister-in-law and the pair make their way to Bethesda Naval Hospital. When JFK's body arrived at the hospital, it is taken for an autopsy. So I remember when uh, Robert Kennedy was informed of his brother's assassination, he basically said, well, they were going to get one of us. And who he's implying they are is still questioned to this day. At 11.28pm, Lee Harvey Oswald is formally charged with the murder of the president. He had been charged with the murder of the patrolman J.B. Tippett earlier in the evening. He still denied his involvement in the murders, claiming, The only thing I have done is carry a pistol in a movie. I didn't kill anybody. I hadn't shot anybody. He then added, I'm just a patsy. And yeah, there's audio of this. It's like one of the very few audio clips of, of Oswald available. And he does seem, I mean, it's a chaotic situation, but he does seem really confused. I'm surprised they let him speak so much and they get so much airtime when he's walking past, talking to the cameras and he's saying all that, you know, all this piece. I mean, he didn't have legal representation as well in those 12 hours, did he as well? Yeah. So uh, on the 23rd of November, 1963, at 3.56 a.m., John F. Kennedy is laid to rest before his funeral in the East Room of the White House. America's new president, President Johnson, declares the 25th of November as a day of national mourning. So this is all happening very, very quickly, isn't yeah. it? The the post-mortem, the charges. This is all laid to rest. Yeah, yeah, 24 hours. 
On the 24th of November 1963, JFK's casket is allowed to be seen by the public. For 24 hours, it has been estimated that over 250,000 people saw the president's coffin. On this same day, Lee Harvey Oswald is shot and killed by Jack Ruby, live on television. Lee Harvey Oswald was being transported to a county jail when Jack Ruby stepped out from a crowd and shot him. Lee Harvey Oswald died from his injuries. It was found, or it is alleged, that Jack Ruby was suffering from a deep state of insanity due to the grief he was suffering from the death of the president. He also claimed to have done it because he didn't want Jackie Kennedy to have to go through a trial over in Dallas. However, many have questioned whether Oswald was silenced. Because that's the point as well. I mean, we'll, we'll go into it, but Oswald is kind of walked out in broad daylight in front of an open crowd. I yeah. believe it was announced that that is where he would be yeah, as the press well, had gathered. If you see the footage, there's a horn that happens as soon as they enter out the building. Mm -hmm. And then a horn sounded again just before he comes in and attacks him. Yeah. So it seems to be like it's a signal. They're out, honk. Honk, now attack him. Yeah. And it's it's like eerie when you get it. You when he, pull he, it out. he pulls his gun out a good couple of seconds before yeah. he shoots him obviously but you can see what's about to happen before it happens it yeah, all yeah. looks very very staged staged yeah it doesn't seem real but we'll go well, yeah we'll go on to a little bit more about jack ruby uh, in a minute so at the same time the nfl faced a barrage of criticism due to its decision to play games whilst the country was in a state of mourning other football leagues cancelled their matches as a sign of respect for the president. However, the National Football Commissioner, Pete Rozell, claimed that he had spoken with JFK's press secretary and he told Pete that the game should continue. Pete Rozell commented, Football was Mr. Kennedy's game. He thrived on competition. Despite this, there was an outcry and none of the games were shown on television. Moreover, later in life, Pete Rozell said that his biggest regret as the National Football Commissioner was playing those games on Kennedy Sunday, the Sunday after President Kennedy died. I wish we hadn't. It caused too much controversy. I mean, we can relate to that in the sense of the Queen passing and everyone saying, why, you back? why has football not been played during this time? Yeah, yeah. The 25th of November, 1963, JFK's funeral followed the same procedure as Abraham Lincoln's. The coffin was covered by a flag and was placed upon a horse-drawn caisson. The coffin was paraded from the Capitol Rotunda to St. Matthew's Cathedral. It has been estimated that 800,000 people will line the streets to watch the president that was taken from them far too soon be carried to his funeral. The horses were led by a riderless horse named Black Jack. To be led by a riderless horse is one of the highest military honours that someone can receive once they passed. It symbolises the hero's final journey. Gotta trust that horse. Hmm. I feel like someone just fucked up one day and said, like, oh, no, actually, no, yeah, I mean, that actually means that he's like respected more. <laughs> Shouldn't you be on there? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, I shouldn't be on How there. much have you had to drink? Uh, I was just got to respect him. Blackjack. Yeah, but yeah, Blackjack can do it. Several notable people were in attendance, including dignitaries and members of the royal family. Were there any Viscounts there? <laughs> I think there was Viscounts. <laughs> oh, fuck. Yeah, I think there's some Viscount Biscuits there. Viscount Biscuits, yeah. Yeah, we know we got it wrong. Yeah. Here's a requiem mass that Jackie Kennedy lit the infamous eternal flame at the gravesite in Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia. John F. Kennedy Jr. was meant to be celebrating his third birthday on this day. Instead, he was mourning the death of his father. In one of the most memorable pictures of the day, JFK Jr. is seen saluting his father's coffin. Yeah, that bit got me a little bit because it, it, if you read that, you think oh, he was probably prompted or guided to do that, but mm. he's completely unprompted and salutes his dad. Yeah. Oh, it's so heartbreaking. On the 29th of November 1963, the Warren Commission is formally established on this day. President Johnson theorised that there may have been a significantly larger plot behind Kennedy's killing and so ordered the commission to find a reason behind the assassination. He feared that the Soviet Union or other forces may have been the perpetrator behind the attack. The commission was also asked to evaluate the death of Lee Harvey Oswald and whether this was a senseless killing or a silencing. The Warren Commission was named after its chairman, Earl Warren. Even from the off with this, I feel like everyone involved in the, the Warren Commission did not believe in a conspiracy. Like many of the American public at the time, I think it was like 87% of them believed it was all down to Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah. But even this commission that they've specifically established to look into the possible conspiracies and possible other reasons behind this attack, I think the entire group of them just thought it was cut and dry. Yeah, Oswald yeah, yeah. did it. Also, so, it's people. Yeah. It's people within that who have things to gain from the. Yeah. And people who were, you know, weren't overly charming with him or agree with a lot of his ideas and the way he looked at things and his political stance. So it's kind of it's like corruption if you're a thief for investigating their own corruption, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. similar kind of vibe to that. The third of December, nineteen sixty-three. For one brief shining moment, there was Camelot. 
is printed in a special edition of Life magazine. Jackie Kennedy was interviewed by Theodore H. White on the 29th of November 1963 and this resulted in a piece called For President Kennedy, an epilogue. This one line would memorialise Mr. Kennedy for Jackie and the world. On the 14th of March 1964, Jack Ruby is put on trial for the murder of Lee Harvey Oswald. Although he initially claimed that he shot Oswald so that Jackie would not have to confront Oswald again in Dallas, his lawyer, Melvin Belly, claimed that Jack was suffering the effects of psychomotor epilepsy. It has been said that defending a client with a mental illness claim was quite uncommon at this time. However, the argument did not work and Jack Ruby was found guilty of murder with malice. He was therefore sentenced to death by an electric chair. Yet in 1966, the conviction was overturned. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals found that Ruby could not have had a fair trial due to the high media attention the case received at the time, and as a result, he was given a retrial. However, before he could reach the retrial, Jack Ruby died of cancer. He died at the same hospital as both JFK and Lee Harvey Oswald. Well, we'll go into more conspiracies after the timeline, but there was even a conspiracy that whoever was behind this Mm. assassination wanted Ruby dead, and so they injected him with cancerous cells. Yeah, I mean, it gets to the point where if you start, like, you assassinate the person so he doesn't speak, and the person you got to assassinate them, you want him not to speak. So the woman that eats the fly, (laughs) end up with a horse in your belly, Dan. Yeah. You know what I mean? On September 19... I hope it's not Blackjack. Oh, no. I mean, it's riderless, though, so it'd probably be easier. It's about licorice. September 1964, after nearly a year of examining, evaluating and analysing all evidence, the Warren Commission found that Lee Harvey Oswald was the sole perpetrator behind the killing of JFK, and so they found no evidence that Oswald was involved with any person or group in a conspiracy to assassinate the president, which isn't isn't much of a surprise. Mm. The 888-page document concluded that Oswald had fired three shots. The commission found that the first bullet missed the target, the second bullet hit JFK in the neck, and then injured John Connolly, and the third bullet was the fatal one that shattered JFK's skull. Despite the Warren Commission's findings, many disagree with their conclusion. John Connolly himself said that he did not agree with the Commission's findings, but the country needed a conclusion at the time. Do they need a conclusion at the time? Because it's like, people want the truth rather than just going, oh, okay, well, you know, it's not quite yeah. right, but... Uh, for me, it's, it's just everything's happening so quickly. Mm. Usually some sort of commission like that would go on, f- in a full and thorough investigation would go on for years. Yeah. That's gone on for exactly a year. Yeah. They've kind of wrapped up the, tr- you know, there wasn't even a, a proper trial for Oswald. Well, even people in the Warren Commission, uh, some people who would famously disagree with what they were saying, go out and pub- quite publicly speak afterwards, which was quite brave of them, saying they didn't agree with the funds. They said that a lot of that's untrue, and I'm sure we're going to go into it. A lot of people who had very, would say certain things privately, would not say them publicly. But yeah, like you said, all nightly tied up in a bow, isn't it really? Oswald was presented to them in a very nice way, and then he wasn't able to speak any further, then Ruby was un- unable to speak any much further, and now they're left with, okay, well, that happened, he killed him, who killed him, and then, uh, yeah, that, that's the conclusion. So that was the timeline, we're now going to move into the aftermath and some conspiracies, well, quite a lot of conspiracies. And I mean, the thing about conspiracies... Wow. It's quite interesting, some of them. I don't know. Some of them. Some of them are interesting. Uh, Sometimes. They can be. I wouldn't, yeah. I, not enough to make, like, a segment about it. Yeah, Just, well, some people some, some people make segments about them. Okay. <laughs> Play the jingly jingle. Ben Carter's Interesting Facts. Interesting Facts. All right, all right. Welcome back to the series finale. Ooh. interesting facts will it be in series 8 will it not be in series 8 we haven't there's a lot of discussions to be had there is a lot of discussions to be had yep. which much like a conspiracy theory yep and the Warren Commission are going to have a lot of lots, lots to say about it I'm yeah sure. yeah well a lot to say the about it. Me. <laughs> nah, <I'm joking. laughs> so conspiracies uh, a phrase that I always hear when people talk about conspiracy theories is oh put on your tinfoil hat yeah let's get their tinfoil hats on mm-hmm. sort of collective as a collective that's what you usually hear it sounds like you've never heard it before ever, <laughs> the well, way you said it. why has that got anything to do with conspiracies does it stop people from reading the thoughts that that could be part of it yes that could be part of it so well, if they're being bugged again that's another possibility yes absolutely but i thought it's fascinating okay well yeah i've said it now well you uh, back to the aftermath <laughs> Shall I go into it? Oh, I guess we yeah. are. Yeah, let's go into it. Let's go into it. So tinfoil hats are typically a piece of self-constructed headgear. Made right, out of tinfoil. Oh, really? Yeah, that structure there. Interesting. Absorb it. <laughs> Speaking of absorbing things, yeah. people that wear tinfoil hats believe that this protects them from threats such as mind control, mm-hmm. electromagnetic fields, 
and as you said, mind reading or mind manipulation. Let's have a manipulation. That's mind control, though. Yeah, manipulation. Kind of. yeah, a little bit. The idea of wearing a homemade headgear for this uh, self-protection has become a popular stereotype and a pop culture meme for tinfoil hatters. This can include, but is not limited to, paranoia, delusions, and pseudoscience and believers in conspiracy theories. So I just thought, okay, has this all started from just one person popping outside with a tinfoil hat on and going, you can't get me. Has, <laughs> is that where it, is that where it came from? I don't from? know if that's where it came where from. Where do you boys think tinfoil hats, the idea of it, the premise of it came from? Oh, that's a hard. It's a big question, yeah. Hard hitting question. That's not really, it's just it's quite a, a big question. A vague, yeah. No, it's, it's not vague. <laughs> So who's the first person that did it? Why? Yeah. Who, when, why, where did it all come from? Um, it's I'm, quite abstract. I'll give you a clue. A very, very Picasso. Yeah. No, but that would have been interesting. Any advances on Picasso, producer Dan? It actually, would it surprise you if I told you it came from a book? Not really. Yeah, it would surprise some people though. Okay. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. So Vice magazine, uh, they weren't behind the tinfoil hats, but they wrote that the tinfoil hat in popular culture can be traced back all the way to 1927, when author Julian Huxley wrote a book titled The Tissue Culture King. Okay. Wherein the main character uses a metal hat to prevent being mind controlled by a villain scientist. Okay. Now I've looked at pictures of this book. Now I've looked at the cover of this book, not, it's not, not a picture book. book. Yeah. No, unfortunately. Decent colour in it. I love that, yeah. yeah. And what it seems this evil scientist, evil villain scientist, is like cloning animals. He's made some snakes with four heads and Ooh. a frog with two heads. Four heads, and, like, like just big. No, like, that would have been that would have been cool though, because oh. then they could have put the tinfoil hats on. Um, yeah, there yeah. You go. But they, they, no, these had no four heads, but there were four snakes oh. on one body. Oh, f oh, wow. Four snakes' heads. Four snakes. Snakes on a plane. Snake. Yeah, snake skin. Snakes four. on a plane. Snake. Four skin. No. PN. The, the phrase, let's put our tinfoil hats on, or tinfoil hats are going to protect us, was be basically created uh, by Julian Huxley in a little book. Quite interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's... And yeah, pe from that, cool. people have sort of taken their own... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. beliefs about the power of tinfoil yeah. yeah and they ran with it they feel like yeah, um actually you know tinfoil hatters have a belief that such devices can protect them from governments mobsters spies corporations and paranormal beings but from the same things that their person was worried about the main i mean these 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 people were, were married were, were worried about a villain scientist initially but yeah it's, but sorry it's I, I, meant, I, I meant as in questions it's fine uh, yeah, yeah i just mean <laughs> From what you said earlier about people wearing them for protection against mind control, mind altering stuff, yeah. and being detected. That's all That's evolved still... from this story. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> okay. I'm with you there. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, just mine on. you saying um, the fact that the people taking that on and taking it forward is just they're still worried about those things. Yeah, it's just different Other genres things of people that yeah. they're worried about. I'm not worried about gangsters thinking I wear tinfoil hat, therefore he can't kill me with a gun. He's wearing tinfoil hat so he doesn't get read my mind. Yeah, that kind find of stuff. Out my, where my wallet is. That time. I mean, I'm sure, sh yeah. yeah. Mobster would probably find oh. it quite quick. Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. I mean, some of them have gone as far as over in New, Ze over in New Zealand, Tom, if I may have one more minute. Ah. Uh, <laughs> in 2022, anti-vaccination protesters in Wellington, New Zealand, mm -hmm. were seen wearing tinfoil hats in a mistaken belief that their illnesses, possibly a side effect from COVID-19, were being caused by electromagnetic rays fired at them by the government. 5G. Could have been 5G as well, yeah. Maybe. It all lines up time-wise. Well, there you go. Line up. But yeah, tinfoil hats, there you go. You know where it came from. Share it at a party. Not the hat. Well, you can have a tinfoil hat party as well. Is that true? That people genuinely wore those hats? Yeah. I mean, Avoid I mean, COVID-19? Not to No, they're worried about they're getting made ill by other things. I mean, there are some COVID... Yeah, sure those things attached, yeah. I mean, there was a tongue-in-cheek experimental study as well done by a group of students that found tinfoil hats do actually shield their wearers from radio waves over most of the tested spectrum. But they would also amplify certain frequencies as well, depending on which what the frequency was. So there's some good and there's some bad Probably to tinfoil put, uh, hats. Some, uh, a really hot day, fried yeah. egg up there. Yeah. 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 We're walking around going, oh, I don't fancy an egg. Yeah. It's Easter. So, yeah, if you want to check it out, just uh, that name again. It's The Tissue Culture King by Julian Huxley, 1927. And, yeah, the pictures are quite scary. It's a scary-looking snake, or set of snakes, and the frog's a bit weird-looking as well. Oh, no. It's like something out of Dan's pond. Oh, God. Actually, you've had a lot of wildlife. I shouldn't be joking about that. It's a fantastic pond with... Um 
an exceptional ecosystem. Thriving. It is thriving, yeah. Yeah. The frog's still alive in there? Or? No, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. We've had a lizard, a couple of lizards. Yeah, two lizards. Anyway, back to the aftermath. Yeah. For years, the assassination of JFK has divided opinion. Many do not believe the official story that was established during the Warren Commission. One of the things that people couldn't believe is that with this bullet, which we're going to talk about a lot, is that it's referred to as the magic bullet. Not one of those vibrators. It's just called a bullet, isn't it? Magic bullets. Oh, okay. Is it? Magic rabbits. Something like that. Rabbits is more for the... Okay. Um, Lit. <laughs> it's multiple. Oh, sorry. That's oh, right. And the arsehole. The arsehole. <laughs> Yeah, so the single bullet theory is a huge thing within this case. It's often referred to as the magic bullet theory, um, which is the, what the Warren Commission decided was what they believed to happen. And they would believe that this bullet would uh, end up causing seven exit and entry wounds in both men, so JFK and Connolly there. So they believe this was shot from the window from the uh, Texas School Book Depository. It passed through Kennedy's neck into Governor Connolly's chest, went through his wrist and embedded itself in Connolly's left thigh. And if this is to be true, the bullet would also have to traverse the back brace that Ben mentioned earlier on. 15 layers of clothing and 7 layers of skin. The thing about this bullet, which we'll go into in a lot more detail about, it it's was seen to be unharmed. Pristine. Yes. Yeah. But there's there's a record of people who had the bullet and passed. It went through about 8 different people. Yeah. yeah. And then it's been said that the first person who had the bullet was a different shaped bullet completely. And it yeah. was incredibly warped. And suddenly it became a pristine bullet. The fact that they've said that yeah, that's definitely happened is is yeah. wild to me. And I don't think it was in the official report, but they sort of claimed, oh, the neck injury that the president suffered, it was only a graze. It sort of grazed his neck, whereas there are clear entry and exit wounds. It's yep. gone through his neck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. The thing that made this theory as well a little bit more confused was the fact that the president actually had, a, had to have a tracheostomy to help him breathe. And that's actually the same point where the bullet was actually made had made contact as well. Mm. So when people originally were saying about the bullet marks, they didn't know about the tracheostomy, which went at the same point. The medical examiners in Texas would go on to do drawings of the actual in, in wounds of the where they'd come in and do measurements. And then slowly over time, where the place where they think the bullets came in, suddenly moved like six, yeah, yeah. 10 centimetres, so it lined up perfectly with the other hole. And everyone was just like, there's literally crossing out of words on people medical journals, people just changing it so it would fit this narrative which is absolutely bizarre. The other question, was there only one shooter? Was Lee Harvey Oswald the mastermind behind the shooting or was there a bigger power that needed JFK gone, like the CIA or the FBI? These conspiracies were only further fueled when in 1979, the House Select Committee on Assassinations disputed and rejected the Warren Commission's claims. And that's a big deal. That's a big mm. deal for them to come out against something like that. Yeah, the, so the I mean, the House Select Committee on Assassinations was set up in 1976. So the Sapruda film, which we talked about earlier, the documentation of the assassination, the video documentation, had been released to the public and lies around Vietnam and the Watergate scandal meant that the public had lost faith in their leaders. Immediately after the assassination, 87% of Americans believed Oswald was the sole shooter. However, that would kind of, well, completely go back on itself. A similar percentage in later years would believe it to have been multiple shooters rather than just Oswald. So the committee was tasked with reviewing the assassinations of JFK and Martin Luther King Jr. Ultimately, they found that it was most probable that John F. Kennedy was shot due to a much wider conspiracy. They found that the CIA and FBI had not done an extensive search when originally conducting research for the Warren investigation. So as we said, I don't feel like everyone was fully invested in that investigation in that committee and none of them really believed in beyond the fact that uh, lee harvey oswald was responsible their aim was to rule out any unlikely conspiracy theories and to conclude whether lee harvey oswald was the sole perpetrator or not i mean still to date in the official archives he is listed as the sole perpetrator but Nobody buys it. No. They question if Lee Harvey Oswald was the only shooter. Lee Harvey Oswald has several ties with Russia, including a Russian wife, as we went through his childhood. So Oswald was a Marine and learned how to sharpshoot, and this is where he became fascinated with Marxism. Prior to the assassination of Kennedy, Oswald, as we mentioned earlier on, allegedly tried to shoot retired Major General Edwin A. Walker. The Warren Commission found that the, this assassination attempt showed his disposition to take human life. I mean, they were watching him, weren't they, for, for years in the build-up? Yeah, he was, he was on the radar for a very long time. They knew where he was and where he worked, and they knew that the, the president was going to be put 
you know going through there on open mm. uh and they, but they didn't do anything to do it well, usually yeah. and usually it's protocol for anyone who's on a certain list which he he was on originally they would be taken away from that area during that time mm. but suspiciously he was taken off that list a, a couple months or a couple weeks before yeah. he went on that tour around there it's really handy as well that he just got a job in that specific building with a specific uh level of floors to mm. have a perfect view yeah the lee harvey oswald one is a very interesting one there's a couple of witnesses who worked at the same building as Oswald who after hearing the shots ran down the stairs and they didn't see the police running up or didn't see Oswald running down they didn't see any of that which in that time frame it would have made a lot of sense that they would have seen would have, they would have seen them they said adamantly that this step they know exactly when they ran out and they didn't see anything happening there or didn't hear the shot from upstairs as well so that's yeah. you know, very peculiar basically the Warren Commission just said oh they're just silly women they got their timing wrong essentially a journalist who was working closely with the police who was very close with dallas police went up to that floor and he saw the bullets perfectly lined on the floor by yeah. the gun which the if the bullets getting fired obviously it's not gonna land perfectly in line yeah, of but then later on the bullets being moved around slightly when he came back in the room to look as if you know a bit more random with its fallen yeah. so a lot of suspicious things going on there well with that as well the kakano rifle that Oswald used obviously my, my eyes lit up a little bit when I saw that name because not being a gun guy I recognised the name of that rifle from uh, a, a cowboy game that I like to play Red, Red Dead Redemption 2 currently my horse on there is called Judge because Vince and Gus died um, and if Judge dies then it will be Sandy and then if Sandy dies it will be Cooper so I've got a plan I'm not great with my horses oh, okay uh, I'd be better off being like a blackjack type horse yeah. um, there have been accidents there's a lot of ravines you can fall into you probably do a cheat and then you can just play as the horse can you that's yeah, online oh. oh you probably could bug it yeah yeah bug it you bug it I think that's a term but Kakano not rifle really a computer is, guy even, yeah it's, <laughs> I mean, not really much of but the Kakano rifle is a rifle that you can use for like long range shooting however it's, there's another rifle that you can use that's much better at long range oh. shooting. it's a bolt action rifle this kakano one which is also a bolt action but just much lower tech very slow at reloading very very uh, inaccurate fire rate and for someone to have reached that distance as well from jfk's car to the building to the sixth floor virtually impossible for the bullet to have traveled that distance from a kakano rifle so i mean people have they've tried to recreate the exact yeah. circumstances with expert yeah. marksmans and none of them could do it and in the time the timing as well the yeah, timing, yeah. Of, of between the, the shots uh, the other thing as well is is worth noting is the, the car's going around a corner from Oswald so he's kind of missed the perfect opportunity in theory to shoot him so why would yeah. you wait until it's going around a corner a tree's kind of blocking the way as well why would he then wait for that moment to shoot yeah well they were saying even with a still target from that distance with that gun it's impossible but this is a moving target because yeah. kennedy's regularly like you know waving to both sides of the road he's moving yeah. about uh, um, and then when he's being shot with the first hit to so quickly then have you know within a few seconds the second shot registered yeah he's moving clenching his throat he's a very active moving target and it's yeah it I mean, we'll get into our beliefs but i think oswald was involved but i don't think he was the only one little lay a little breadcrumb there we'll follow it i mean we've talked about oswald's early life there was certainly motive for him to assassinate the president uh, by himself just as the warren commission found but what if he was working with an external source? At least 40 witnesses to the shooting were adamant that the gunfire came from a grassy knoll that was in view of the motorcade. They reported seeing smoke and smelling gunpowder in the area after the shooting. In addition to this, acoustic recordings that came from one of the policemen's radios, this was one of the policemen's on the motorcycles following, the audio from that was extracted and analysed, and they were the main reason behind the House Select Committee on Assassination's findings. The recordings have since been disregarded, but at the time it proved that at least four shots were fired, not three like the Warren Commission found. I mean, as well, that recording wasn't set, wasn't used for a very long time no. afterwards as well, so it's a bit strange how it was kept away from everyone for such a long period of time. Furthermore, footage from the Sapruda film, which you mentioned earlier on, which showed a frame-by-frame -frame analysis of the shooting, proved that Oswald could not have reloaded his gun quickly enough. The gun that Oswald used could not be reloaded and shot three times within 5.6 seconds, as the Sapruda film shows. Also, the Sapruda film showed that Kennedy's head went from the back and ended in a left direction. This would suggest that the shooter did come from the grassy knoll rather than the Texas School Book Depository. So, yeah, I mean, that's one of the biggest thing, what, what the things that find in this case, how they're trying to say, oh, no, this shot from behind. When it's clear as day, yeah, if yeah. you watch the video, I mean, I, again, I mean, they're not gun guys, but it's clear as day where the impact comes from. Yeah. And there's even, there's a lot to do with the bone of the skull, a fragment, a missing from the back of his head, 
which um, someone actually found I think, a day later or so at the bone on the floor, wow. handed it in. But by that time, the post the post mortem had already been done and it had been spatially doctored, so you, it wasn't the big. Yeah, because they wanted him to be presentable for the uh, funeral as well. Yeah, it basically being yeah, as if a funeral director had kind of done done their work, but ma- their magic on you know on a, essentially a crime scene. But essentially, you could see the brain matter from the back of the head, this big hole that would have been there, all these details, which suddenly you know would very much not would lend itself to that being the exit mm-hmm. wound. The fact that they've just gone, no, no, this th- this is the theory we're sticking with. There's a Pruder film, literally, I can't say how anyone could deny that. Yeah. And the absurdity of the, the bullet, the magic bullet theory, and people just go, yep. Well, no. I mean, it, on that then, if we followed that, if we go against the official narrative, I don't think anyone expected the Sabruda film to have existed, existed and yeah, yeah, for yeah. anyone to have been recording, which was a big problem, let's say, that they were in on it. So Abraham Zapruder, the man that shot this footage, he ended up selling the footage for $100,000, which is almost, or $115,000, I was one of the two, which is worth almost a million dollars in today's money. He sold it to a magazine. Then it was released to the you know public, people were able to see it. Then the government apprehended the footage so that they could analyze it themselves and keep it mm. sort of away from the public domain. There was an argument about whether that was morally okay for them to do, so they sold it back to Sabruda for $1. Years and years went by, it became sort of part of the National Archives, but also then Zapruder's family were given a payment of, I think it was $16 million. And it's kept in a museum now, isn't it? Yeah. By, by the gun that was apparently used. Yeah. And, well, and, and that, that sort of crow's nest, the room, mm. has now been turned into a museum, museum as well. Yeah. And it looks pristine. They've kept all the cardboard boxes. They've glassed off the the room itself and then everything else is left there. It's, it's really... Mm. And there's an X on the road, which marks the precise spot that Kennedy was assassinated on. There's an episode of Dark Tourist mm. uh, or Dark Tourism on that as well. And there's loads of like JFK assassination trips that you can go on out and they're all like on moon on uh, golf buggies drinking and they've got music playing and stuff it's really bizarre the grassy knoll itself there are other people that were filming and taking photos from that day and there are images of this grassy knoll which would have given a shooter or a group of shooters absolute clear as day Mm. um vision and sights on on the president and again many people claim to have heard noises from that area smelt gunfire from that area but if we go back to our very first episode the vegas shooting there were loads of people that believed the other side of the festival that there was another shooter and they could hear it and, and smell it, but that was obviously the echoes yeah. going across the area. So, yeah, I mean, there are so many different conspiracies to this. So if there was a second shooter, who could they be working for? This theory has been sparked since Lee Harvey Oswald said he was just a patsy. So was he a scapegoat for a wider conspiracy or was he working with someone? The Soviet Union's involvement has been a big conspiracy theory that has stemmed since it was found that seven weeks before the assassination, Lee Harvey Oswald had visited the Soviet consulate in Mexico City. The CIA also theorized that the person Oswald met with was a member of the KGB and part of their assassination department. Moreover, with it becoming public knowledge that there was a CIA plan to assassinate Fidel Castro, it doesn't seem unlikely that he may have retaliated. According to one theorist, on the day that Kennedy was assassinated, Castro ordered an intelligent officer to listen to any little detail, any small detail from Texas. Furthermore, the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 put tensions at an all-time high between the USSR and the USA. It's been said that Fidel Castro knew of Lee Harvey Oswald's trip to Mexico City. As well, Brian Nettle writes, Fidel knew of Oswald's intentions and did not deter the act. However, as many have noted, it would seem an impractical act to place Lee Harvey Oswald as a scapegoat from the USSR, considering they were on the brink of world destruction with the USA just a year prior. Castro Gratz on, on a report would say later on that he felt like it was assassination from the government themselves, essentially. But yeah, he obviously washed his hands on him being in any way involved within the assassination. Some have questioned whether the mafia and or CIA and FBI were involved in, the, in a conspiracy to kill the president. JFK was cracking down on organised crime. Many have questioned whether Jack Ruby killed Lee Harvey Oswald in attempts to silence him. Although there are no definitive links to suggest Jack and Lee even knew each other, it's been widely speculated that Jack may have killed Lee to stop him talking about his links with the mob. In fact, the Warren Commission investigated whether Jack and Lee were working together and found that on the day of the shooting, Jack was five blocks away from the scene of the crime. So Jack Ruby has been said to have links with both the CIA and the mob, and he looks very mob- mobbish. He does. Um, so yeah, it's widely debated that Jack Ruby was part of the mob. He was a strip club owner, and it's suspected that he established links to the mafia. It's thought that JFK may have used the Mafia to win his campaign in 1960. However, this has been widely disputed. Both JK and the Mafia did not like Fidel Castro. Johnny Roselli, who was later known to have a part of the CIA plot to murder Fidel Castro, and Sam Giancarlo 
were allegedly known to both Kennedy and Jack Ruby. It is thought that Sam had a direct connection with the Kennedys through the unlikely match of Frank Sinatra. His connection with the Mafia would ultimately get him killed just before he was about to give a testimony regarding the Mafia's involvement in the Castro assassination. Perhaps the Mafia wanted to kill Kennedy for payback. Was he using the power that the Mafia had given him to go against them and prevent organised crime? Moreover, did they think the President was incompetent due to the failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion and therefore a new leader needed to be in place? I mean, I think personally for me the CIA and him threatening to disband it you know when you get the really cliche films where there's a guy who's part of the army he's like we need just we need to strike now yeah yeah yeah. He, yeah it seems like that those people were genuinely real people and he was like no well we don't need to do that and then people were really pissed off he wanted to, to disru- disrupt the CIA he said to smash into a thousand pieces and get rid of people yeah. And then it seems, you know, it wasn't long after that he was killed. Uh, and there was a, a speech he made. It's a really famous speech. It's on YouTube. It's a very long speech, but it was around secret societies and having a transparent government that didn't mm-hmm. hide anything from the general public. And obviously, there are that's a whole other episode. I think of the conspiracies around higher societies that control the world. But he made a very public, very clear speech, basically outing secret societies and uh, that he was going to close them all down, not allow them to exist. And that is where I feel he probably made enemies that were capable of arranging an assassination. But I also think there's motive there for Lee Harvey Oswald. But I also, the more I think about it, I mean, everything points to Harvey Oswald being involved to some extent. Mm. If you believe one conspiracy, why would you not believe that actually, yeah, he was a patsy and he had, you know, he well, there was framed. Yeah, there's in theory, there was, um, there was links to other assassination opportunities that could have could have happened to JFK, but they didn't. They fell through in the end, and there were similar people to Lee Harvey Oswald in the area in similar buildings at the time. So it felt like if they had different situations where they could have attempted this, but those parades, for whatever reasons, didn't happen on those days. So they had these people placed ready to kind of be the patsy in that scenario. Yeah. Another thing that we haven't mentioned, um, which is a huge part of the case, and I find fascinating, is the fact that the brain, essentially, when they were lo- using, using it in the post-mortem, it basically was it was intact essentially it was bre- and I mean, it looked brown and pickled it, lo- it looked like you know it had been around for a long time it wasn't his brain because obviously his brain would have been we know it was splattered all over the place but this brain was fairly intact and they basically wanted to say well, this 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 shows that the the exit wound was here and the entry wound was here but then the brain was then essentially lost in evidence and it was never be, never to be seen again uh, obviously with new techniques they could actually prove the entry point of the, of the bullet now but the, that brain how can you lose a president's brain? Yeah. And yeah, as I said, it looked brown and pickled this brain. It just looked completely alien to what it would have looked like. And this is a bit of a weird, weird detail. The brain that they were using as the evidence, it weighed more than the average person's brain. But obviously, we know that the, yeah. <laughs> the brain the brain fragments would have been everywhere, so it's going to weigh considerably less. Yeah. So it, it is, it's, they, they went above and beyond to kind of keep the Warren Commission theory believable and true. Yeah, I mean, it's still listed today as the, as the, the, it the is mad. cut and dry narrative. A couple of series by Oliver Stone, um, who made the film, and, and yeah, very, very in depth on the political side of things, as well as the post mortems and all the little details. It gets very heavy, but if you're fascinated by the case, it's definitely worth a watch. There's two other short tangents as well. So, the Babushka Lady and the Umbrella Man. So, the Babushka Lady is an unidentified woman who was president who was not president she was present during the assassination and she's seen in many photographs but she's also seen holding a camera herself her nickname arose from the headscarf that she wore which was similar to scarves worn by elderly russian women so babushka literally translates to grandmother or old woman many eyewitnesses apparently saw her filming the entire event she was observed on the grassy knoll between Elm Street and Main Street and apparently just she was completely expressionless and on her own throughout the whole process. I mean, many people have come forward to claim to have been the babushka lady, but she's, you know, she's never been publicly named. There's also Umbrella Man, who basically was a man standing. I mean, he does look kind of out of place. It's, Mm. you know, it's a very hot sunny day and he's wearing a uh, a dark jacket and holding an umbrella, but some people hold umbrellas to stay out of the sun. But it was, yeah, it was a man named Louis Stephen Witt who appears in the Sapruda film as well. But basically he does look out of place, but he's literally holding an umbrella. (laughs) There was also Badge Man. Badge Man. Uh, So Badge Man again, unknown. I mean, each frame of the Sabruda film has been completely mm. analysed to a ridiculous extent. But the Badge Man is an unknown figure that is purportedly president in Mary Mormon's photograph of the assassination. However, people can't see him or no witnesses remember seeing him on the day. So it's almost like a, 
Well, it's a very bizarre. But the badge man has been described as a person wearing a police uniform. The moniker itself derives from a bright spot on the chest, which is said to have been a reflection of a badge. But people wonder if that was CIA, if that was mm. some sort of uniform. But yeah, I mean, the, the we'll pop the photo up. It's uh, There's an enlargement of the badge man. It doesn't look like a person. I mean, you tell me if you see a person there. Oh, wow, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was one more which I hadn't heard of, which is... Uh, the Free Tramps, oh, maybe you're better reading this one. The Free Tramps are free men photographed by several Dallas area newspapers under police escort near the Texas School Book Depository shortly after the assassination took place. It does look kind of sketchy. So early allegations were the men were believed to have been behind this because they were receiving a police escort and they've been identified and, and, and had nothing to do with it. So, yeah, they've been cleared. So another thing about the Umbrella Man, some people believe that he may have fired a poison dart into Kennedy's neck, which gave Oswald the opportunity to shoot. However, Louis Stephen Witt, also known as Umbrella Man, was actually using the umbrella to heckle the president. A black umbrella was seen as a notable sign of Neville Chamberlain. Many did not agree with JFK's support of the Nazi appeaser. Louis questioned about his involvement in the assassination by the House Select Committee on Assassinations, to which he replied, If the Guinness Book of World Records had a category of people doing the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong place, I'd be in the number one in that position. Mm -hmm. I don't really think that's how Guinness Book of Records works mate it's more like dictionary just a definition of wrong place wrong time but um, i can see what he's trying to do another popular conspiracy theory for many is that lyndon b johnson orchestrated the assassination so that he could gain power the main reason that jfk was in dallas at the time of the shooting was because lyndon b johnson had set up the event and it is well known that lbj and jfk did not particularly like one another and kennedy had verbally expressed to those close to him that he had concerns over the presidential route that johnson would take if he got into power. Many sources report that Johnson was made aware on several occasions that it was not safe for Kennedy to visit due to the political tensions within Dallas, yet Johnson still pursued the trip. In 2017, it was released that the KGB had information that stated that the assassination was not the deed of one man, but it arose out of a carefully planned campaign in which several people played a part, which linked Johnson to the killing. It's even been speculated that he asked for another couple to sit with the Kennedys in the, in, in the motorcade rather than the Johnsons, who were close friends of his. Lyndon B. Johnson looked even more damning when an extramarital lover of his named Madeline Brown claimed that the night before the assassination, Fascination, he whispered in her ear, After tomorrow, those Kennedys will never embarrass me again. That's no fret. That's a promise. I mean, if that is true, then obviously that is very damning. So the presidency of JFK is one that's gone down in history, not just for his assassination, but also for his work. He was a president who was young, handsome, and knew how to captivate an audience through his speeches. He was one of the first presidents who was seen majorly on television, and this helped hugely with his public image. Presidents after him have often quoted JFK's speeches to gain popularity that he once had. Unfortunately, we may never know who killed him, but we do know his, his presidential reign continues to be remembered. As Jackie Kennedy said, for one brief shining moment, there was Camelot. So that was the case of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Have we reached any kind of idea on our own opinions of this? Because I feel very, I'm leaning towards multiple different conspiracies. I do not buy, all I know is I do not buy the official narrative. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I can comfortably say I don't buy the official narrative. Do it, you think um, Oswald was involved? I kind of don't. Mm -hmm. I think him being a patsy I kind of was leaning towards him being a patsy more than anything I think Johnson and the CIA together um, were who I'd lean toward personally yeah. I think yeah, I think a bit of a patsy yeah I definitely think that there was the um, some sort of higher society or secret society were to blame but I still can't make my mind up on um, Oswald I really can't one minute I believe he was absolutely involved the next minute I believe he was the perfect patsy the weird thing him. about this it doesn't seem to be an obvious as much of uh, concrete evidence, oh, this dispels this bit yeah. of evidence. But usually you get loads of that when you look at the conspiracies. It's like, this means for a fact this can't be true. But yeah, it's, it's as I said, it's, it's probably the most cut and dry one for me that is definitely conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's, it's harder than some to actually get a formulated opinion on exactly what went down. This is the thing. There are so many people that stood to gain from him being assassinated. Yeah, definitely. Um, we haven't, we've not gone in depth on the mafia as well, but so many people believe them to have carried out the hit. Yeah, similar to the Diana one in the sense of him not promoting war, wanting to take withdraw troops, withdraw selling um, goods and that. A lot of people just said to lose a lot of money from that, similar with Diana, with the mines and whatnot. Mm -hmm. A lot of people were going to lose a lot of money. So, you know, quite easily could be 
could be a factor there. But yes, so that is the case of the JFK assassination. It's, as I said, we've kind of just touched the surface of it. Uh, there's lots more out there. It's a very fascinating one to get into and look into. And do let us know your theories down below. And if we've missed anyone out in particular that you uh, you believe, we would love to hear it. Dan, did you have an opinion at all? It's very difficult. Um, the only thing I'm, I'm set on is that there must have been multiple angles. Yeah. And the accuracy of that shot. I don't know. You could put that to a bit more of a professional rather than just some, some guy taking the shot. Definitely. Yeah. Well, he'd got worse at, at, as a shot over time as well and less involved with guns, so... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true, Dan. Very he, true. I do think he's a pansy. I think it's going to be relatively quick lookalikes as we haven't got a great deal. Yeah. So, yeah, it's time for our lookalikes. Oh, that, look like, that looks like a bit like that. Don't you? It's a bit like this. I've got... One that I'm quite happy with and one that's going to annoy you. Okay, I'll, well, I'll go... F yeah, you go first, and then... Would you like the one that I'm quite happy with, or would you, would you like the one that I think is going to annoy you? Annoy me? So, Babushka Lady... I need to get these on the same is page. Is it someone who's wearing a, a scarf? That looks like... Uh, no. Dan's already laughing so he's seen it. Dan's happy with it. Let me just fucking... <laughs> Let me just happy with it. Yeah, he's happy with it. Babushka Lady, Dr. Octopus from Spider-Man. It's one of the best photos I could get of Babushka. Right. And uh, then this is Dr. Octopus. S sunglasses, literally. So it's just kind of the shape of the face and the nose. It's not the shape of the face. It's literally sunglasses. Okay. Yeah. So that's pretty good. That was the one that I thought was going to annoy you. <laughs> <laughs> it really got Dan. <laughs> you like it? Yeah. You like it because it's absurd rather than... <laughs> It's quite similar. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It is quite similar. <laughs> because I've showed you them on separate pages, I reckon that's what's throwing That's you. probably what's throwing me, to be fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, to be honest, page, everyone always says yours are better than mine, so I obviously do they? I, I think they do, yeah. So I'll go with, my, go with mine, and I don't strongly stand by it, but I was struggling. Um, it's it's uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. I think he's got similar eyes. Maybe he has, I don't know. Similar eyes to Ed Norton. Or I think Ed Norton could play him. Oh, yeah, that's very good. It's not yeah. my best. It's not my best. No, I, um, I tell you what, I think um, a combination of who I've gone for Oswald and you who you've gone could work quite well. Dan's already got also got a cheeky little one, which Dan, I find. Yeah, yeah, this is... I'll, a, I'll, I'll, I'll get that one ready. A big seller for the series finale producer. Dan's got a, a look alike. So I think Lee Harvey Oswald looks a lot like Brian Callan, a comedian that we both quite find for. Yeah, that's solid. But I think mixed with Edward Norton, we could have a winner there. If those two had a child. Oh, Dan has gone for a young JFK. He believes looks like <laughs> Gary Hobbs from EastEnders. Okay. Which, so... Okay, if he was skinnier... It's just the eyes, isn't no, it? Yeah, the eyes and the cheeks. There he is, Gary Hobbs. Oh, Dan, that's good. Thank you very much. <laughs> He's just like, yeah, He's like, oh, that guy from EastEnders. And he's just like, Gary. So, um, yeah, but yeah, very I've, interesting. I've one popped uh, Dr. Octopus on the same page for you now. It oh, might thank change goodness. your opinion. Uh, sadly, it's literally just, no. um, the, just the sunglasses. People, the nose sure, and sure, the people, lips. sure people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you said fucking Green Goblin, I think everyone, <laughs> <laughs> everyone will be supporting you. Yes, it is the season finale. And Dan, producer Dan's kindly asked um, our Discordians, uh, the cult members, send us a little, some little voice notes in, haven't you, Dan? I have indeed. And if you're not part of the cult, why? Why aren't you? So yeah, please do come and join us over at icmap.co.uk. At the time of this episode going live, I think we've got like 107 or 108 episodes over there. Some really big ones lately as well. We recently covered Chris Chan, the Christchurch Mosque Massacre. We're covering uh, Big Lurch, the case of Big Lurch. It's just come out this week, so some big cases over there. Although we're going to be taking a little break to prepare for Series 8, we will still be posting weekly content over there, which is icmap.co.uk. So we now also have audio versions of all those 107, 108 episodes that are live on the site. And we have an exclusive RSS feed there, which will allow you to play all the audio episodes on your favourite podcast devices. Yeah, you won't have to be playing the video and trying to do it when you try. You know, it'll be easier to go use. For yeah, go for a run, listen to it, all the Minnesota, loads of Minnesota's on yeah. there. We have two levels on the on the cult. We've got the Prestige, we've got the just cult members. Prestige get access to our Discord server and a live stream every month as well. And Dan has been talking to Discordians really recently and they've been really active and he's asked for a few voice notes from them. The cult of ICMAP. <laughs> yeah, so here we go. Well, first of all, I haven't got a voice and I've got a text message from Nikki. Hi, Hi Nikki. Nikki. 
She says, I enjoy uh, being part of the cult because you guys seem like the most sincere people in the true crime world. (laughs) We're putting on an act. We really are. Yeah, that's not us. I love how informative your your coverage of cases are and I love how you treat the cases with respect uh, they deserve. Community-wise... Uh, I love that people seem to be there for one another and it's completely different to any other community that I've been a part of. That's glorious. Oh, so Thanks nice. for all that you do. Big love and big love to the cult too. Oh, oh. Nikki. Happy to have you in the cult. And right, let's place a couple of voice notes. We haven't heard these yet because oh. they've come in fresh off the... Uh, they've not been vetted. Yeah, yeah. They have not been vetted. Mm. First one is from Kit. Hey, Kit. My name is Kit, and in the cult, I am Kit the Goblin. I love being part of the ICMAP uh, cult. It's been a really great community. People have been supporting each other, helping each other. We've had silly moments, funny, like, funny little in-jokes that have started to already form. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Learned some very interesting things about people. And um, generally fact- found a really nice community where... We're all a bunch of weirdos together with a common interest. So just want to say thanks to Tom, Dan, and da- Tom, Dan, and Dan. Tom, Dan. <laughs> thanks to the guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Three done. For bringing us all together. Tom, Dan, and Dan. Looking forward to next series. All the love. Kit the Goblin. Amazing. Uh, thanks, yeah. Kit. Thanks, Kit. Fantastic, Kit. Okay, uh, that was a lovely one. Uh, next voice note is from Lex. Hey, yeah. Lex. Here we go, Lex. Hello, Lex. So, my name's Lexi, and I just wanted to take Lexi. a couple of Hi, moments to tell you why I absolutely love being part of the cult of uh, ICMAP, and it's not because I'm brainwashed. Um, <laughs> The community is just fabulous. Uh, The Discord is a wonderfully supportive place full of amazing people, including um, our beloved boys. And to top it all off, you get discount on the merch. So what's not to like? Oh, I mean, that's Lexi. We didn't didn't even mention that, Lexi. So you you, you had her back there. So we appreciate it. Pleasure to have you. Uh, And lastly for tonight, we have another voice note uh, from Adam. Adam. Amen. Hello. Oh, ICMAP boys, just want to start with a massive congratulations on one of the best series so far. Well, Seven you. has wow. been off the charts. Oh, crikey. It's been amazing. <laughs> congratulations, boys. And I hope you know how much we appreciate such a good season. So if anyone doesn't know, my name is Random Hero or... Adam, depends on how nasty you feel that day. Nasty. But just a little thing about the cult. Some of the upsides of the cult. It's a brilliant community. You feel accepted, loved, and you can talk to like-minded people with very, very morbid curiosities and morbid interests about murder, death, killers, all of the above. It's been amazing to get to know loads and loads of people. And oh, you yeah. seem to feel like you're not so weird with these <laughs> interests, which is lovely. <laughs> I love it. And it's amazing. Thank you so much, ICMAP. And it really does make me so happy to have such a beautiful community like oh, I do with you guys. Adam. Oh, Legend, Adam. Thank, Thank you, Thank you Adam. so much. A pleasure to have you, Adam. Big part of the community over there. But yes, guys, um, enough of us giving you the old freaking hard sell. It's not worry about. But, um, we're gonna have we're gonna hibernate a little bit, have a little yeah. bit of time off between series, but we'll go keep back you in to the, the nest. Go back to that freaking nest, the cave, and yeah, basically we're gonna regroup, get ready for the, ne- the next series. There's gonna be a few little changes we're thinking coming up for next series, maybe in terms of how we're gonna produce and and, and put out content. But we'll keep you in the loop with that and once we uh, decide exactly what we're gonna be doing. But yes, thank you so much for your support this series. It's got it's been a very big series, absolutely. and it's been absolutely great to do it for you guys. In in terms of staying in the loop with us, the best place to find us is on all the social medias at Could Murder a Pod. Instagram, we'll be updating daily on there with regards to what we're what we're up to. We've got Twitter, Facebook, we've got our own website, icmap.co.uk. Um, I've because I've said it a few times already, but it'd be really great to see you over there. We've got some fun episodes. Like Tom said, we really appreciate all the lovely feedback from series seven. It's been pleasure. Big thank you to producer Dan for making well, Danny boy. making all the magic you, happen. Big thank you to Tommy boy. Pleasure. It's been a good one. It's been a good one. And a big thank you to little Ned who joined he's late dabbing. in the series, but he's done his he's done his bit, and dabbing. Ned is dabbing. 
That is a dabbing Ned. That sounds but, like a kind of fish. I was close to a dabbing Ned. <laughs> and thank you to Ben, of course. Thank you, Ben, for the interesting facts. I'm sure we'll be getting some interesting facts in the next series. Maybe even more interesting than, May. than the one of this series. Can we get that? I don't know. And we promise you guys that we, well, we do actually do it. We do Google what words are said like, and we, sometimes we say it wrong, we're so sorry. <laughs> but um, we'll, we're going to work in it. Everyone's got, you know, you always need space to improve. So, yes, thank you so much for your support. We'll be back again soon. And if you haven't already, why not subscribe to the YouTube channel? There'll be some new content being put out over there. We're going to try some few different things over there. Mm. So keep an eye on that. And if you listen to us on audio, why not give us a review? It yeah. does really help. And, and following us on there, it does really help us more than you will ever know. One massively kind thing that you could do for us is just to tell your friends and family about us put Ikemura podcast in their ears or in their eyes and uh, or, both. That, or both yeah give them both at the same time and that would really really mean a lot to us because that will help the podcast grow we also wanted to say a huge thank you to Gully Gums for pairing with us uh, for another series we really appreciate it why not head over to Gully Gums' website and get yourself some festival gums I was very gums. on the point you're on brand today yeah you know how this sticks I, and I could see Oswald probably Dusting this off in the garden or something? In the garden, dusting it off in the garden. At uh, the chat. Yeah, uh, you can go on your head over there and use the codes KILLBAN and KILLTOM for 30% off on your vintage goods. But thank you so much to them once again for supporting us this series. And guys, final one of the series, but like we always ruddy well say. We say this all the time. Keep doing what you're doing. Well, unless it's getting up to no good on the grassy knoll. Maybe I don't think. bring an umbrella out on a hot day because people will think you... Well, they just think you're weird. You've got alopecia. Well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could, that, that's fine. Fair enough, that's fair. It might have been. Yeah. I mean, he, we said he well, didn't know that. We said we didn't do it was a protest in Ooh. Chamberlain, wasn't it? Yeah. But, um, uh, but yeah, if you have, a, obviously, if you need it for medical reasons, have it. You've absolutely done yeah. me that. Yeah. All right, then. Oh. Have I? Have I? Yeah. See you later. It's only just hit me. Two pip. All best. See you guys. See you series eight. He would read books whenever he had spare time and would regularly be found in public libraries. The books, for him, were a form of escapism, but he also soaked up the jizz. <laughs> he could... <laughs> uh, I can't... What was there before jizz? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs>